civile et l'épanouissement de nos populations. Mesdames et Messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, chers collègues, sans anticiper sur les conclusions du présent sommet africain sur le climat, dont le succès est pour notre continent d'une importance capitale. Permettez-moi d'évoquer le chemin à parcourir, à mon humble avis, avant de nous retrouver début décembre à la COP28 de Dubaï et parler d'une seule voix. En effet, nous aurons mis septembre à New York, en marge de l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies, des discussions de haut niveau qui porteront sur la création d'un marché carbone souverain mondial conforme aux intérêts de nos nations africaines. Puis, c'est à Brazzaville, en République du Congo, que se tiendra les 26, 27 et 28 octobre prochains le sommet des trois bassins des écosystèmes de biodiversité et des forêts tropicales Dernière étape avant la COP28. Un sommet voulu par les présents du Brésil, de l'Indonésie, de la République démocratique du Congo et de la République du Congo. Un sommet creusé d'une coopération entre le bassin du Congo, celui de l'Amazonie et celui du Bornéo-Mekong, Asie du Sud-Est, et que j'aurai l'insigne honneur d'abriter en ma qualité de président de la Commission climat du bassin du Congo. Mesdames et Messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, Mesdames, Messieurs, les trois bassins concentrent 80% de la biodiversité mondiale et constituent le régulateur de l'équilibre carbone de la planète. Le sommet de Brazzaville visera, dans une coopération sud-sud, à soutenir les efforts des Nations Unies en faveur de la restauration et de la conservation des forêts tropicales, des tourbières et des mangroves. Mais bien plus, elle visera à mettre en place une plateforme de propositions et j'ose le dire, à établir un rapport de force capable de peser de tout son poids sur les résolutions qui seront adoptées à la COP28. La coopération entre les trois bassins ne sera donc pas un club exclusif replié sur les seuls intérêts des pays membres. Bien au contraire, en agissant sur les négociations de la COP28, elle servira de levier aux exigences de justice climatique et d'accès aux financements internationaux de l'ensemble des pays du Sud et en particulier aux exigences de notre continent. Dès lors, la réussite du sommet de Brazzaville 
après celle de Nairobi, est déterminante pour l'Afrique. Que le secrétaire général des Nations Unies soit d'ores et déjà remercié pour son appui inestimable. Mesdames et Messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, et vous tous qui vous battez pour la cause climatique, je vous invite à nous rejoindre à Brazzaville pour ce rendez-vous qui précédera la COP28 de Dubaï. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me now give the floor to President Isaiah Safawoki, the President of Eritrea. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Excellencies, heads of state and government, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me first to express our gratitude to President William Ruto for hosting the African Climate Summit and for the warm hospitality accorded to us. Climate change holds, by all accounts, one of the most pressing challenges of our times. Its impact in Africa will be immensely aggravated, compounded as it is by a host of other major hurdles. Extreme weather change that entail more frequent and intensified droughts irreversible change to Africa's ecosystem, marine biodiversity, as well as rich flora and fauna, cannot bode well in Africa's potential and aspirations for rapid economic growth. They will also mortgage the opportunities and livelihood of future generations. Through there are reservations and skepticism on the accuracy of the forecasts and doomsday predictions in relation to the voluminous scientific data collected so far. There are also those who bemoan media hype and sweeping generalizations pronounced in various conferences. But these differences of emphasis notwithstanding, the gravity and urgency of the situation will be downplayed only at our collective peril. In this perspective, and in our modest view, efficacy and impact of our collective response is positively correlated with the linkage and synergy we develop in a three-pronged approach the national, continental, and global platforms and networks. The policies we articulate and the implementation mechanisms we map out at the individual national level will not provide the primary panacea to this global challenge. The second tier approach that has particular relevance to the summit here are the programs that can be pursued at the collective continental level and supplement our individual national endeavors. In this context, Africa can tap and incorporate the numerous scientific measures undertaken by global players in the field to bolster its purposeful mitigation measures. At the institutional level, it will be important for our continent to establish its own professional African advisory panel to undertake timely research and complement 
available literature on the subject. The structure can cascade down to regional and national levels as appropriate so as to generate comprehensive and accurate scientific research and information that has wider validity and applicability for all the continent, the continent's part. Africa must strive to foster and develop viable and national framework of cooperation on climate change at the global level or in the third track. This is vital both for reasons of synergy and also because Africa deserves much support as it has largely been on the receiving end. Indeed, its greenhouse gas emission footprint has been and remains comparatively small. In conclusion, may I remind this August gathering that Africa mobilized its own resources rather than extend hands for handouts that may aggravate the existing situation by inviting interference and corrupt practices while mobilizing our own resources will be enabling and motivating creativity at the level of the continent. I urge everyone to not be attracted by the billions that are being promised by so-called donors. Rather, we would like to mobilize our own resources and get away from this dependency that will definitely compromise everything at the level of the continent. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. President. A round of applause for President Afawoki. Let me now take this opportunity to request my brother, His Excellency President Paul Kagame, the President of Rwanda, to make his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Excellency, Dr. William Samuel Ruto, President of the Republic of Kenya. Excellency Azaria Sumani, President of the Union of the Comoros and uh, Chair of the African Union. Excellencies, Heads of State and the Government. Excellency Musa Faki Mahamad, Chair of the African Union Commission. Excellency Ulusra van Leyen, President of the European Union Commission. Right Honorable Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Excellencies, First Ladies, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. First, I wish to thank President Ruto for hosting us in a beautiful and vibrant Nairobi for the Africa Climate Summit, organized in collaboration with the African Union. Every year, the world is reminded of the real and growing threat of climate change. Recent findings tell us all kinds of stories, including that July was the hottest month ever recorded in human history. Africa continues to carry the burden of rising temperatures, despite contributing the smallest share of global greenhouse gas emissions. We cannot just keep talking about it without doing what is required to fix the problem. This is unfair, but in the long run, playing the blame game is not the answer. A more pragmatic approach is for Africa to be a key player in the research, in the search for global climate solutions. 
Africa stands united and should remain so in this and in its position. In this regard, allow me to take this opportunity to commend President Dr. William Ruto for his exceptional leadership of the Committee of African Heads of State and Government on Climate Change. In Rwanda, we want the private sector to play a greater role in building a green economy. Our strategy is to position ourselves as an attractive destination for international climate financing and investment. That's why the COP27 at that summit, Rwanda launched IREME Invest, a green investment facility created by the Rwanda Green Fund in partnership with the Development Bank of Rwanda. So far, more than 200 million has been mobilized, US dollars that is, from domestic and international partners, including the European Investment Bank and the Green Climate Fund. We have also been working closely with the International Monetary Fund as a participant in the Resilient and Sustainability Trust. We have access to long-term financing to further integrate climate into our economic policies. This is a good sign that the international community is taking seriously the call to reform our global financial architecture. But there is still room for improvement. In this context, I welcome the discussions held at the Paris Summit for a new global financial pact. The Bridgetown Initiative, spearheaded by Prime Minister and Minister Mia Motley of Barbados, also deserves consideration and serious attention. Any meaningful structural change must favor debt restructuring and lower interest rates, as President William Ruto has so eloquently explained. As chair in office of the Commonwealth, Rwanda supports the development of a multidimensional vulnerability index led by the United Nations in partnership with the small island developing states. Gross national income, GNI, does not accurately measure a country's vulnerability to climate change. In any case, small islands and developing states should not be penalized for having high, higher income levels. Ultimately, what Africa wants is fair and equal partnership, which takes our priorities into account. That is going to be the basis for trust and solidarity. I hope this summit will serve as a good foundation for discussions later in this year at COP28. I thank you for your kind attention, and Mr. President, thank you for convening us here. Round of applause for President Paul Kagame. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Now is the opportunity for President Salva Kiir, the President of South Sudan, to make his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor.
Your Excellency, Dr. William Ruto, President of the Republic of Kenya and Chairman of the Committee of African Governments on Climate Change, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government. Your Excellency Antonio Guterres, United Nations Secretary General. Your Excellency John Kerry, United States Climate Change Envoy. Your Excellency Dr. Sultan Ahmed Al Jaber. COP28 President, Designate, and the UAE Special Envoy for Climate Change. Honorable Ministers for Climate Change, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon. <clears throat> Let me start my remarks by expressing my deepest gratitude to the government and the people of Kenya for the warm welcome and for successfully hosting this first Africa Climate Change Summit. Excellencies, the biggest threat faced by humanity today is climate change. It is a threat whose effects are felt by all. <coughs> but its causes have their roots in the action of a few. Take Africa for an instance. We collectively emit less than 5% of carbon, but we are the most vulnerable region. My country, South Sudan, with the tiny emissions, for example, is currently experiencing floods, droughts, heat waves, and irregular rain patterns. We have over two million people who have lost their livelihoods as a result of climate change and are in dire need of support. In the face of this reality, we cannot continue to lament about the impact of climate change, nor continue to wait for the financial support that has been promised but not delivered. We must seize this opportunity. Given to us by, by this African Climate Summit to come up 
with, uh, with additional ways to address the impact of climate change. Why am I calling for, for additional measures? The reason is very clear. The $100 billion that was pledged at the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP15, in, 20, in, 20, in 2009, has not been delivered. More importantly, that amount is not enough because Africa alone requires over three billion, three trillion dollars to enable, mitigate, and adapt to the climate change. As Africans, we need to understand that uh, transitioning to low carbon economy Will, uh, will come from within and its path lies in uh, operationalizing the theme of this uh, summit, driving green growth and climate finance solutions for Africa. And uh, well, and the well, this is the way to go. Driving green growth will allow us to come up with solutions that will address the financial gap between what was pledged in Copenhagen summit in 2009, and the actual figure needed by African countries to combat climate change. Excellencies, in South Sudan, we are endowed with the natural resources and the challenges we face as a country are about finding ways to exploit these resources in a sustainable manner. The key question we have always is how do we responsibly exploit these resources in ways in ways that contribute towards mitigation and adaptation to the impact of climate change. Part of our answer to these challenges lie in aligning our climate change, our climate change policy with climate action plan that, cut, that cuts emissions and adapt to climate impact. Presently, South Sudan has developed its second nationally determined contributions with the goal, with the goal of generating 3,000 megawatts of renewable energy from hydro, solar, with the solar with wind, solar wind and 
geothermal gas. This to us is the path to net zero carbon by 2050. On top of this plan path, we aim to embark on climate smart agriculture to, to meet our food needs. Apart from changing how we, we plan our development to mitigate the impact of climate change, we also have a vast potential in carbon, in carbon trading that can generate further uh, revenue to finance our climate adaptation. Our natural forests and the soot wetlands have the largest capacity to absorb carbon in the well. In fact, I'm proud to say that the Sud wetland in my country is the third lung of the well. These ecosystems can sequester millions of tons of carbon dioxide annually, and in them lies the potential for carbon trading. I, I, just, I just mentioned. Excellencies, what I have enumerated are steps we can take individually as countries to, to reverse the impact of climate change. However, we in the Global South expect developed countries to play their part, first by cutting their emissions. by over 45% and second by, by, by leaving their commitment that was made in uh, 2009 in Copenhagen to finance climate adaptation in developing countries. We cannot meet the target of maintaining the temperature rise to 1.5 Celsius by 2030. If developed, if the developed countries fail to meet their commitments, both in providing resources to assist with climate adaptation and leading the way in cutting their own emu emu emissions. Once again, I congratulate Kenya for successfully organizing the first Africa Climate Summit. I hope that all of us will speak with one voice at, at COP28 in Dubai. The time for climate action is now. I thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Let's give a round of applause to President Salva Kiir. Let me now take this opportunity to request President Macky Sall, the President of Senegal, to make his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, President William Ruto, dear brother, chers collègues, chefs d'État et de gouvernement, Monsieur le Président de la Commission de l'Union africaine, Monsieur le Président en exercice de l'Union africaine, Mesdames et Messieurs les chefs de délégation, Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, distingués participants, je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président Ruto, pour votre aimable invitation, pour l'accueil convivial qui nous a été réservé à l'occasion de ce premier sommet africain sur le climat. Je voudrais également saluer votre leadership qui, encore une fois, a été démontré dans votre message très puissant ce matin. Le moment est en effet propice pour faire le point sur l'état de mise en œuvre des engagements sur le climat et convenir d'une position africaine commune. Tout le monde le sait, les périls liés au réchauffement climatique continuent d'affecter nos pays. Et pire, ils se sont même aggravés. Le dernier rapport du GIEC confirme que les pays africains resteront parmi les plus impactés par le changement climatique, alors même qu'ils contribuent pour moins de 4% des émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Face à l'urgence climatique, l'Afrique, il faut le dire, réagit à la mesure de ses moyens à travers des initiatives novatrices et la recherche de solutions sobres en carbone et résilientes au changement climatique. Au plan continental, 11 pays de la bande sahélo-saharienne exécutent le projet de la Grande Muraille Verte depuis une décennie. À ce titre, le Sénégal met en œuvre un programme de reboisement de 500 000 hectares de forêts classées et de 500 000 hectares de plantations pour endiguer l'avancée du désert, lutter contre la dégradation des sols, restaurer la biodiversité et soutenir les activités agro-silvopastorales. Nous poursuivons également nos efforts de réalisation de projets sobres en carbone, résilients au changement climatique, y compris en matière de transition énergétique. Et grâce à la mise en œuvre de notre programme de mix énergétique, les énergies renouvelables représentent aujourd'hui 31% de nos capacités électriques installé, dont une importante partie en énergie solaire. Les autres composantes proviennent de l'éolien et de l'hydroélectricité. Nous exécutons en ce moment un important programme d'électrification rurale de plus de 1000 villages financés pour 75 millions d'euros en partenariat avec le Fonds Vert Climat et la Banque Ouest Africaine de Développement. Alors, ces efforts seront renforcés grâce à la stratégie « Gaz to Power ». Nous devons, à ce propos, nous entendre. On ne peut pas empêcher à l'Afrique d'utiliser ses énergies domestiques. Nous devons, évidemment, dans cette phase de transition, veiller à ce que les solutions africaines soient sobres en carbone et résilientes, 
Mais on ne peut pas, pour ceux qui polluent, pour moins de 3%, demander que l'énergie de transition soit abandonnée. Ce serait une autre injustice faite à l'Afrique. Pour nous donc, le gaz est une énergie de transition. Et notre politique de transition énergétique vers la neutralité porte également sur le système de transport de masse avec le train express régional opérationnel depuis deux ans qui transporte plus de 130 000 personnes par jour, qui est un train électrique, mais également le bus transit rapide dont les essais sont en cours et qui verra son exploitation avant la fin de l'année 2023. Dans le même esprit, le Sénégal a signé en juin dernier avec les partenaires du G7 son programme pour une transition énergétique juste, le JETP, avec un plan d'investissement qui prévoit la mobilisation de 2,5 milliards d'euros pour une période initiale de trois ans. Nous avons l'ambition de porter à 40% la part des énergies renouvelables dans notre mix d'ici 2030. Cela dit, et il convient de relever que pour l'essentiel, les pays africains réalisent leurs projets verts en recourant à la dette, à la dette et vous l'avez rappelé, M. le Président, alors que le financement de l'adaptation devrait être soutenu par des dons ou tout au moins des crédits concessionnels conformément aux engagements convenus dans l'accord de Paris sur le climat. Dans la perspective de la COP28, il nous faut par conséquent poursuivre le plaidoyer pour la mobilisation des ressources dédiées au financement vert. C'est la clé de voûte du combat contre le réchauffement climatique. C'est l'action climatique conséquente par une mobilisation responsable et solidaire de tous les pays développés comme pays en développement. Pour terminer, je voudrais exprimer mon soutien à l'Alliance pour l'infrastructure verte en Afrique, initiée par la BAD, Banque africaine de développement, l'Union africaine, Africa 50, pour soutenir la réalisation des projets sobres en carbone et résilients au changement climatique. J'appelle tous les partenaires à contribuer à cette nouvelle initiative. Je remercie enfin le Centre global pour l'adaptation dans son travail de promotion pour le programme d'accélération de l'adaptation en Afrique. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Thank you very much, Mr. President. A round of applause for President Macky Sall, please. Now it's the opportunity for President Jacinto Felipe Nussi, the President of Mozambique, to make his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Asante Nguraisi Ruto Naongera kwa mkutano mzuri na kujaribu kurudisha heshima kwa Afrika. Sois Lisa William Ruto President of the Republic of Kenya, Sua Excelência Azar Osman, President of Comoros and President of the United States of the African Union, Illustre Chef of State and of Government, Sua Excelência Moussa Faki, the Chairman of the Commission of the Union African Union, Excelências, my Senhoras and my Senhores, eu começo por agradecer o convite do Presidente Ruto e a calorosa recepção, o convite para participarmos nesta Semeira Africana sobre o clima organizada pelo Governo do Quênia e a Comissão da União Africana. Excelência, a decisão da Assembleia da União Africana em fevereiro deste ano para a realização desta semeira surgiu 
da necessidade de construirmos uma visão africana compartilhada sobre a crise climática que afeta o mundo e com muita gravidade o nosso continente. No caso específico de Moçambique, o país sofre ciclicamente o impacto das mudanças climáticas. Isto não ouvi dizer, é o que nós vivemos, praticamente a partir de fevereiro, todos os anos, até agora até maio, ficamos prontos à espera que alguma coisa vai acontecer, não de uma ou duas vezes. Desde 2019, sofremos os ciclones Idai, Kenneth, Gombe, Dineu e Fred, várias tempestades tropicais cheias e seca. O ciclone Fred foi extraordinário, porque levou mais tempo, mais de 14 dias, e entrou no meu país duas vezes. Entrou, saiu para o mar e voltou, tornou a vir a Moçambique, e depois saiu para o Malawi. Os desastres naturais ceifam vidas humanas e retardam o desenvolvimento de Moçambique, tal como acontece em muitos países africanos e não só. Excelência, Sr. Presidente, desde manhã as intervenções que, que nos procederam foram exaustivas. Tentaram explicar o que é mudanças climáticas, por que que acontece e o que que não se faz. Por isso, Vou evitar repetir o que foi dito e gostaria de ser mais objetivo e direto, partilhando a experiência de Moçambique no que tange ações de prevenção, adaptação e mitigação das mudanças climáticas, sendo de destacar as seguintes. 1. Um, as áreas de conservação. 25% do território nacional, e isso é de Moçambique, está coberto por parques, reservas, coutadas e fazendas, incluindo áreas de proteção marinha. Neste âmbito, várias ações estão em curso, lideradas pelo governo e com a participação de parceiros privados e comunidades na proteção destas áreas, o que reduziu a caça furtiva de espécies como o elefante, rinocerontes, leão, assim como a exploração ilegal de madeira. Por que, que falo das comunidades? Porque muitas vezes nós falamos sozinhos. Quem vive ao longo de onde se identifica a natureza é a comunidade. Então, esta gente precisa de compreender e estar conosco para poder proteger aquilo que lhes beneficia. Falei também da fauna dos elefantes, como se sabe, os maiores jardineiros da floresta é o animal, concretamente, neste caso concreto, o elefante. Tudo que nasce, se não protegermos o animal, o nosso jardim floresta pode estar a sofrer ameaças. 2. Moçambique acomoda parte de mais extensa da floresta de Miombo, que é o maior ecossistema de florestais tropicais do mundo e que se estende por mais de 2.574 km de comprimento ao longo da grande bacia do Zambés. Como forma de proteger esta bacia, que abarca oito países da África Austral, realizamos no ano passado a Conferência Regional Sublema por uma gestão sustentável integrada do Miombo na construção de resiliência às mudanças climáticas e proteção do Grande Zambés. 3. Em Moçambique, a gestão do risco de desastres em Moçambique é, é regida por lei, que estabelece um sistema integrado de redução de risco, a gestão de desastres, a recuperação sustentável para a construção da resiliência humana, infraestrutural e dos ecossistemas, bem como a adaptação das mudanças climáticas. Importa aqui sublinhar que, por exemplo, cada obra que se ergue em Moçambique agora tem que observar esta lei para se tornar resiliente. Quatro, criamos o fundo de risco e seguro contra desastres naturais para responder às situações de calamidades naturais e apoio aos grupos vulneráveis. 
Uma das componentes fundamentais no processo de prevenção, adaptação e mitigação é o envolvimento das comunidades, como me referi, mas seis estamos a promover a agricultura de conservação. É uma componente prioritária na nossa estratégia de produção e segurança alimentar. Promovemos a preservação da qualidade dos solos, uso sustentável dos recursos hídricos e a prevenção das queimadas descontroladas para reduzir o desflorestamento e a desertificação de fenômenos com impacto nas mudanças climáticas. Sete, gestão de energia de biomassa, dado que as nossas comunidades rurais dependem sobretudo do combustível lenhoso. Temos estado a expandir a eletrificação rural a partir da rede nacional da hidroelétrica de Cabo Arabaça e de centrais solares no âmbito da iniciativa Energia para Todos. Para além da expansão da barragem de Cabo Arabaça, que serve também a alguns países da região, Estamos a investir em novos empreendimentos hidroelétricos com destaque para o projeto de Mpandangua e da central de gás de Timane. A central de gás de Timane vai ser maior, com mais de 400 megawatts. Oito, esta é um curso, está em curso o programa de ordenamento territorial através do Plano Nacional de Desenvolvimento Territorial e dos Planos Espaciais. Isso acontece porque muitas vezes desrespeita-se o espaço. Se nós não ordenamos as nossas vilas, as nossas cidades, então são susceptíveis à erosão. Nove reformas legais e institucionais centraram na adoção de legislação sobre a proteção de biodiversidade, incluindo a reativação das mais importantes no agravamento de mold das molduras penais contra, portanto, agravamos as penas contra a caça furtiva, abate e tráfego ilegal da madeira, entre outros crimes ambientais. Como resultado destas reformas institucionais de Moçambique, tem se destacado nos créditos de carbono florestal, sendo o primeiro país africano a receber o pagamento pelo Banco Mundial por causa do carbono. Reforço do sistema de aviso prévio através da iniciativa de um distrito uma estação meteorológica. Mais uma vez, estou, tenho estado agora a citar aquilo que estamos a fazer, porque nós sofremos ciclicamente, o que fazemos é reforçar o sistema de aviso prévio para preparar as populações na altura que esses desastres ocorrem. Ainda este ano inauguramos um radar meteorológico na cidade da Beira, na região centro do nosso país, com o alcance de registrar ciclones no raio de 400 km, estando prevista a instalação de mais dois radares desta dimensão nas regiões norte e sul e desta forma estaremos a cobrir o país. Foi adotada uma declaração, a declaração de Maputo sobre o sistema integrado de aviso prévio que se enquadra nos instrumentos de orientação estratégica operacional. É importante também partilhar que Moçambique acolhe também um centro de operações humanitárias de emergência da SADEC, uma instituição vocacionada à proteção e à prevenção. Moçambique tem uma longa costa marítima de cerca de 2.700 km, o que nos impõe uma atenção especial ao oceano, como regulador do clima e temperatura do planeta. Ratificamos a Convenção Marpol de 1968 contra a poluição do mar, que completa a legislação nacional aplicável à pesca ilegal e à proteção da biodiversidade marinha. Enquanto nós não protegermos a biodiversidade, então provocamos o mar e assim contribuímos para o mal-estar do ambiente. Excelência, antes de terminar, Sr. Presidente Ruto, mais uma vez quero felicitá-lo por essa iniciativa e apelar a todos os líderes aqui presentes no sentido de subscrever de forma unânime a declaração de Nairobi sobre mudanças climáticas 
e apelo à ação de todos nós. Muito obrigado pela atenção. Thank you very much, Mr. President. A round of applause again for President Nusi. Let me now take this opportunity to give the floor to President Nana Akufo Ado, the President of Ghana. Your Excellency, you have the floor. President Ruto, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I join other speakers in applauding the Kenyan President, our host, President William Ruto, for his initiative in convening this summit and thank him for his hospitality. A summit to define a common African position towards the deliberations of COP20. 28 in Dubai is a highly commendable one, especially if you can help us define how we can mobilize our own resources to address this critical issue of climate change. Ghana's nationally determined contributions towards combating climate change have been fully incorporated into government's coordinated program for economic and social development policies to facilitate their implementation. We have introduced major policy interventions that have development and climate projection imperatives. Our flagship programs, whether they are the programs for planting for food and jobs, or one village, one dam, or one district, one factory, are all geared towards boosting industrialization and rural development, as well as building our resilience to the impacts of climate change. The strategic focus of the One Village, One Dam initiative, for example, in the northern regions of our country, is to provide all year round access to water to smallholder farmers who practically have no viable or livelihood alternatives during the long dry season. We're also determined to make natural gas, which we have in abundance, available for the generation of electricity. We placed a ban on illegal mining, the phenomenon we call galamse, which was destroying our water bodies, vegetation, and our forests. Some 20,000 young people have been engaged to plant more than 30 million trees in two years to create jobs and restore degraded land. These policy initiatives are already using positive results to the attainment of the SDG goals, particularly the goal of reducing our carbon emissions. Additionally, I have established an advisory group of prominent private sector chief executives who are setting up a 100 million SDGs delivery fund and a $200 million green fund to complement government's efforts at tackling climate change and funding the implementation of the SDGs. Whilst we strive to do our bit to haul climate change at the national level, we expect also a lot to be done at the international level. One major issue of concern to us is the need to streamline access to international climate finance to complement national funding. I believe this forum will throw more light on practical ways to mobilize financial resources to support the implementation of national climate actions, especially how we can guarantee a different future from the past and ensure that the commitments of the developed world towards climate finance which have not been met in the past, will be met in the future. Excellencies, it is obvious that we have to act swiftly and decisively to mitigate these effects and ensure a sustainable future for generations to come. The impact of climate change, as we know, 
is not limited to the African continent alone. It is a global issue that affects all of us. Thus, addressing climate change in Africa, as President Ruto so, so forcefully articulated, is a moral and strategic necessity for global climate action. Hopefully, COP28 in Dubai will provi provide us a concrete roadmap towards that end and ensure a just energy transition for us in Africa. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. President. A round of applause again for President Nana. Let me now take this opportunity to ask my sister, the President of Tanzania, President Sulu Hassan, to make her statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Your Excellency, President William Ruto, President of the Republic of Kenya and Chair of the African Committee of Heads of State and Government of Climate Change, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. gentlemen. Uh, Mr. President, thank you very much for being a gracious host of this August Assembly that sets the tone of Africa's growth now and the future. I thank the government and the people of Kenya for the excellent preparation of the summit and the warm reception accorded to me and my delegation. The convening of this important summit is both timely and opportune at the theme driving green growth and climate finance solution for Africa and the world is quite befitting, especially now ahead of COP28, where parties will take stock of our efforts to address the climate crisis and commitment to address both climate crisis in the context of the Paris Agreement and the Climate Convention itself. Excellencies, the stakes are high and actions have to take place not tomorrow, but today and literally now. As Africans, we have no choice but to see the moment to capitalize on its potential to offer solutions to green growth and decarbonization and while creating resilience to its co communi our communities and economies. We can no longer afford to address economic development, climate change, and African poverty burden in, a, in isolation. The interplay between development and climate change is undeniable, and this interlink demand integrated and coherent solution that will provide opportunity for socioeconomic development of Africa. Excellencies, while continu uh, the continent is highly impacted by the ch changing climate, it is nevertheless holding the key to solving the climate challenge. The just released Economic Development in Africa Report 2023 shows the potential of Africa to capture technology intensive global supply chains and it said it all about development of Africa with climate change. It provides a unique insight into Africa's centrality to the green transition that will clearly transform our continent economies. It is said that they literally, it is said that all metals and minerals that are important and strategic for the low carbon transition are abundantly found in Africa. And these are chromium, lithium, natural graphite, nickel, nobium, rare earth metals, 
silver, and many more. Given the abundance of these minerals, the continent needs to reposition itself not only as a supplier of raw materials globally, but strengthen the value chains by ensuring their conversion into intermediate and final products is done within the continent. As critical minerals, as they were called critical minerals, they have to make critical contributions to our internal revenue collection and employment creation. They also have to contribute critically in the environmental protection in our countries. So having all these, Africa has to stand firm to use the materials for our own development. Excellencies, human capital dividend in Africa is another force to reckon. To avoid the past mistakes uh, in the history of the, our continent, we need to focus on human capital advancement by training our own people, especially youth, uh, so as to be able to reap from these vast opportunities. We need to consider the climate crisis as an opportunity to address the youth unemployment challenges. Excellencies, beyond the African potentials, we have potentials in our individual countries. My country, Tanzania, is leading the way by demonstrating strong momentum in driving the green growth. Almost 95% of our energy is from hydro and natural gas. We are also leading in nature conservation with almost 38% uh, of our land mass under conservation in various regimes. We are also committed in nurturing the ecosystems that hold the promise of creating thousands of new jobs and unlimited national economic and global benefits. Talking on the offering of critical mineral to the world, Tanzania has huge deposits of some of these critical minerals needed today. Helium is present around Lake, uh, Lake Rukwa Basin. Nickel deposit around Lake Victoria. Graphite reserves at the southern eastern part of the country. And we also accommodate other deposits, critical minerals, including copper and lithium, as well as rare elements. Despite of the above scenario, we, however, need to face the fact that Tanzania and indeed the whole of African continent still faces unprecedented impacts of climate change with limited capacity to finance the mitigation and adaptation needs. And thus, as we head towards COP28, we have to raise an African voice on the establishment of a spatial establishment and capitalization of a special fund for Africa. The contribution which, uh, and the pledges which are given by the advanced uh, countries have to say what percentage of those pledges goes to Africa and not just a blanket <laughs> pledges. As I conclude, and as you are all aware, Tanzania is hosting the AGRF Food and Agriculture Summit this same week. The presidential summit is on 7th of September, uh, a day after tomorrow. I therefore wish to use this opportunity to once again invite you to Tanzania, and I'll personally be there to welcome you all. Once again, once again, I congratulate you, Mr. President Ruto, for organizing such a successful event. And I look forward to seeing you all in Dar es Salaam. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Another round of applause for President Samia Suluhu Hassan. Now it's my pleasure to request my brother, 
President Mohamed Yunis Memphi, the President of Libya, to make his remarks. Your Excellency, Mr. President. فخامة الرئيس ويليام روتو رئيس جمهورية كينيا رئيس لجنة رؤساء الدول والحكومات الأفريقية المعنية بتغير المناخ السادة رؤساء الدول والحكومات الدول الأعضاء بالاتحاد الأفريقي معالي السيد موسى فقي محمد رئيس مفوضية الاتحاد الأفريقية السيدات والسادة يطيب لي أن أعبر عن شكري لفخامة الرئيس ويليام روتو ولحكومة وشعب كينيا على استضافة هذه القمة الهامة لأفريقيا وللعالم وأن أهني الرئيس روتو على قيادته الرشيدة والفاعلة للجنة الأفريقية المعنية بتغير المناخ وأثمن الجهود التي تقوم بها المفوضية من أجل التوصل إلى موقف أفريقي موحد اتجاه المسائل وهذه المسألة والمسائل الأخرى محل اهتمامنا لقد نادت أفريقيا منذ تأسيس منظمة الوحدة الأفريقية وما زالت وبصوت واحد إلى أن يرفع عنها الظلم التاريخي الذي وقع عليها وما زالت بعض صوره ماثلة إلى يومنا هذا ولكننا أمام التحديات والمخاطر التي يفرضها تغير المناخ على العالم بأسرة دعا الاتحاد الأفريقي إلى أن نتكاتف جميعا أغنياء وفقراء شمالا وجنوب إلى حشد الجهود والموارد التي تقلل من المخاطر والتكيف مع التغيرات وتحويل هذه التحديات إلى فرص تقوم على أسس الشراكة الاستراتيجية تؤدي إلى سد الفجوة التمويلية والفجوة التقنية لتمكين أفريقيا والجنوب العالمي من الانتقال من خانة الحلقة الأضعف إلى خانة الشريك بما يوفر للعالم إمكانيات أوسع للتكيف ونحمي من خلالها كوكبنا ونحقق بها تنمية أفقية مستدامة يجب أن تكون هناك إجراءات تتصف بالاستعجالية للحد من أي ضرر أو أضرار أخرى لا يمكن إصلاحها تهدد أنماط الحياة على الكوكب وما نحتاجه المزيد من الحلول وأفريقيا قارة واعدة في هذا الشأن كما بيّنت الوثائق المرجعية لمؤتمرنا هذا أفريقيا ستوفر لكوكبنا إن التزم شركاؤنا بانتقال حقيقي في موقفهم فرصة حقيقية للتعامل مع الخطر بطرق أكثر فاعلية بدءا من معالجة انبعاث الكربون إلى النمو الأخضر مرورا بالمعادن الخضراء التي توفر التحول والاستدامة في مصادر الطاقة التي بالإمكان استخراجها واستغلالها بطرق صديقة للبيئة من خلال سد الفجوتين التمويلية والتقنية وكذلك رفع نسبة مساهمة رفع نسبة مساهمة مصادر الطاقات المتنوعة مثل الطاقة الشمسية والرياح وشبكات الذكية لتعويض انخفاض الانخفاض في توليد الطاقة من الوقود الإحفوري وهو ما يظهر الحاجة إلى مبادرات مناخية توافقية لمكافحة تغيير المناخ وتجاوز المصالح الفردية لعدد من الدول الصناعية الكبرى مطالب القارة الأفريقية كما هي ظاهرة وفي وثائق هذه القمة 
وفي مقرر مؤتمر الاتحاد الأفريقي الذي تقرر فيه انعقاد هذه القمة قبل مؤتمر دول الأطراف في نوفمبر القادم في أبو ظبي وفي مشروع البيان السياسي لقمتنا هذه يجعلنا نتمسك بموقفنا الداعي لرؤية شاملة نتجاوز الخطوط الفاصلة بين أفريقيا ودول الجنوب الأخرى والدول الصناعية الكبرى ونرسم ملامح المرحلة القادمة على أسس إننا شركاء من أجل هدف واحد وفق وسائل عمل بناء ومشتركة نحيي الحاضرين معنا اليوم الشركاء الإنمائيون المنظمات الحكومية الدولية والقطاع الخاص المشارك مراكز البحث العلمي والأكاديميون منظمات المجتمع المدني النساء والشباب والمشاركون في هذا المعرض البيئي وسيكون علينا بعد اختتام أعمال مؤتمرنا هذا الذي سيتوج بإعلان سياسي يمثل الموقف الأفريقي الموحد أن نحشد جهودنا ونحن نستعد للمشاركة في مؤتمر أبو ظبي كوب 28 من أجل الدفاع على ما سنختتم به أعمالنا هنا في نيروبي شكرا جزيلا وشكرا فخامة الرئيس Thank you very much, Your Excellency. A round of applause for President Memphi again. Thank you. Let me now take the, uh, this opportunity to ask my brother, Julius Bayo, the President of Sierra Leone, to make his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, President Dr. William Ruto, President of the Republic of Kenya, Your Excellency Azali Azumani, President of the Union of Comoros, and Chairperson of the African Union, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Your Excellency Musafaki Muhammad, Chairperson of the African Union, Commission, Your Excellency Antonio Guterres, United Nations Secretary General, Your Excellency Patricia Scotland, the Secretary General for Commonwealth, Your Excellency First Ladies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm pleased to address this high-level session of the African Climate Summit 2023 under the Kenyan presidency and to reaffirm Sierra Leone's commitment to scale up climate action urgently. I must thank His Excellency President William Ruto and the government of the Republic of Kenya for the excellent arrangements made for this summit as Africans, African countries seek to address climate change priorities in this critical decade. From coastal kisses with the Atlantic Ocean to the panoramic vis vista, from the towering king of the mountains, the Loma Mountain, to our sprawling national parks, Sierra Leone is a canvas painted with nature's most vibrant hues. Our golden beaches are a testament to nature's artistry. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. If you've not been to Sierra Leone, I'm inviting you to come. However, beneath our nation's beauty lies an unmistakable urgency. With a median age of just over 19 years, our young population, like the other young populations representing Africa's vibrant future, stand at a defining crossroads. Their legacy, and indeed our collective legacy, 
is shaped by the choices we make today. The seas once serenading us with gentle lullabies, now one of rising tides that could erase generational achievements. The rains which celebrated our lands now pose a looming threat. Why Sierra Leone is a rich, it's rich with nature's gift. This very geographical splendor renders us vulnerable. Climate change for us isn't a distant shadow. Climate projections in Sierra Leone include temperature increases, extreme weather conditions, intense precipitation, and rising sea levels. Our shores, symbols of natural grandeur, are receding. Many of our communities face displacement and our pristine beaches risk fading away and calamities like landslide and floods have become hauntingly regular. The surge in pests and diseases is another testament to our enduring imbalance. Without swift collective action, we risk witnessing the obliteration of Sierra Leone's invaluable ecosystems, leading to further disloc dislocation of our communities and the devastation of their sources of sustenance. This is not just a Sierra Leone story. It is an African story. And I dare say it is a global story too. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our world is in trouble. But our continent is even more so. The evidence is clear. The time for action is now. But we are running out of time. Grounded in this stark reality, my government remains unwavering in our commitment to fortifying climate resilience, ensuring our people thrive sustainably and harmoniously with nature. In our updated nationally determined commitment, Sierra Leone has defined a progressive pathway forward for cutting greenhouse gases emission from the 2005 levels by 5%, 5% by 2025, 10% by 2030, and 25% by 2050. My government is unyieldingly devoted to climate change resilience and adaptation. This includes support for community-based adaptation in agriculture and energy sectors, integrated water resource management, and climate change disaster risk management. We are also poised to improve meteorological services for early warning systems and enhance and protect conservation of natural habitats and ecosystems. Furthermore, our climate change mitigation strategies extend to promoting renewable energy, infrastructure, resilience, and extensive reforestation efforts on at least 960,000 hectares of land. As we engage in country planning, we will also prioritize low carbon screening. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. To reaffirm our commitment, we have institutionalized efforts against global menace, this global menace, we have established a dedicated Ministry of Environment and Climate Change and a Climate Change Renewable Energy and Food Security Presidential Initiative led by Dr. Kande Yomkeda. We are designing policies and programs and laying the framework for establishing strong partnerships for funding and implementing projects on major cross-cutting thematic areas of national and global significance. Agriculture is the mainstay of our economy. Recognizing the 
core importance and extreme vulnerability of agriculture in Sierra Leone, we are focusing on resilience and innovation within this sector, leveraging technology and forward-thinking strategies for climate adaptation. Our, our overarching aspiration as enshrined in our national development plan is clear. Achieve food security and nutrition, food and nutrition security by 2030 through climate smart practices bolstered by renewable energy throughout the agricultural value chain. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, meaningful inclusion and intergenerational dialogue are crucial to achieving SDG 13 to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. In Sierra Leone, we consider our women equal partners for development. We passed the progressive gender equality and women's empowerment bill, which guaranteed by law a minimum of 30% representation of women for all appointive and elective positions. My government is committed to promoting the inclusion of women in climate resilience programs and the participation of women in decision making for climate change adaptation and mitigation governance at all levels. We must harness our, geographic, our demographic dividends on the continent and involve our youthful population in our climate adaptation and mitigation efforts throughout by involving the youth in everything that we do. Sierra Leone's quest for environmental resilience hinges upon our capacity to address climate finance build local competencies, and refine our legislative blueprints, and etc. Solutions like carbon markets, innovative debt swaps, and novel financial tools, such as leveraging our natural resources, may be our bridge to surmount the fiscal chasm. Our appeal is clear. Sierra Leone seeks equitable, equitable nimble and timely access to climate financing. We ask for unbarred access to new climate change adaptation and mitigation technologies and shared knowledge. Our salvation from escalating climate crises lies in collective wisdom and concerted efforts. Another challenge is our institutional prowess in designing programs that attract climate finance is still developing. We yearn for guidance and backing to boost our legislative architecture, especially concerning forest conservation. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, while shared the responsibility for climate adaptation and mitigation is not and should not be evenly distributed. Expecting countries like Sierra Leone to be at the brunt of a crisis that scarcely, contrib it scarcely contributed to without robust support from the primary emitters, the industrial giants, is fundamentally unjust. Our stance is unequivocal. We are here to collaborate, not to capitulate. We seek cooperation, not charity. The actions of significant polluters must pivot from mere declarations and vague commitments 
to actionable, technology-driven reparations. It is a demand grounded in the technical feasibility of climate justice, not just its moral imperative. A unified front against the existential crisis is not just desired, it is imperative. As I close, I implore all of us present, the hourglass of action is dwindling, and the sands of time wait for none. Let's come together, not just in spirit, but in action, but in actionable solidarity, for in unity we find just strength, but not just strength, but salvation. Thank you. Another round of applause for President Bio. Thank you very much. Now let me take this opportunity to request my sister again, Her Excellency Sale Wok Zude, the President of Ethiopia. Madam President, you have the floor. Your Excellency, President William Ruto, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a very important summit. Congratulations to the African Union for organizing it and for Kenya for being our gracious host as it is in the tradition of uh, this country. Africa has tried its best to make uh, its voice heard. This is not the first time that we meet to do so. In fact, to speak with one voice and uh, to alert partners of the disastrous consequences. Ethiopia has been on the forefront of this fight. A lot has been done to coordinate our efforts in order to have a strong common position. Common position is indeed always needed in our African Union Forum. Today it's about climate, but the continent's major issues such as peace, stability, progress requires indeed our common position. It has been increasingly difficult to explain to our people and particularly to our youth this contradiction, resource-rich continent and yet poor people, to explain the injustice that has been mentioned many times here today. That is why our summit cannot and should never be a, a talk show, but a place where concrete actions and actionable actions are being taken. Let me also say that uh, without sufficient research publications, it would be difficult for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, to get accurate representation of Africa's special needs and circumstances that would build evidence-based for advancing the key ask of the continent. So it is imperative that as Africa, we prioritize investments in our research capacity to develop scientific publications, to inform and guide global efforts to combat climate change. We must emphasize on investing in African research institutions to produce regionally relevant science that can inform the different working group under the IPCC. This endeavor requires a strong commitment from both African scientists and the international community accompanied by the financial capacity necessary to deliver this research. Ethiopia has witnessed in the past decades, including the last consecutive years, 
persistent drought, flooding, locust invasion, where millions were severely affected. We've been carrying out different practical policy and action interventions as a step to contribute to emission removal and building adaptation capacity. Besides, we've also put in place national adaptation plan to build and boost resilience and adaptation capacity. Building climate resilient green economy is one of the pillars of our 10-year national development plan. As part of our strategic consideration, we have launched the long-term low emission and climate resilient development strategy that has been submitted to the UNF C with the aspiration to achieve net zero emission and building climate resilient development by 2050. The Ethiopian Green Legacy Initiative that has been mentioned again today, that, has, that was launched in 2019, uh, has succeeded in planting 25 billion seedlings on the degraded landscapes by mobilizing volunteers throughout the nation. The initiative helped for the development of more than 120 nurseries and created more than 180,000 uh, jobs throughout the country. Most imp more importantly, the initiative is intended to inculcate the green behavior in each of our citizens. The greening has been uh, the Greening Initiative has been scaled up into fruit-bearing uh, perennial trees, thereby directly linking the initiative with our food system transformation strategy. In the agriculture sector, Ethiopia has achieved notable progress in enhancing its, uh, its wheat production, effectively transforming a deficit of 15 million metric tons in 2019-2020 into a surplus of 65 million quintals in 2022-23. I thank this achievement has enabled Ethiopia to meet uh, not only its uh, domestic need and in fact comments uh, with exports. This gives me a good opportunity to thank the African Development Bank, and most particularly its president, my young brother, for the support that uh, was given to us. The plan is to cultivate 2 million hectares during the dry season alone in 2023. The success of wheat production is critical for the country's efforts to enhance food security and achieve food sovereignty. In terms of renewable energy production, Ethiopia is also investing on green energy projects such as hydroelectric, wind, solar, and geothermal energy sectors, as well as promoting modern rural cooking technologies. We have successfully run the hydro uh, energy producing projects, including the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam with domestic resources, which will significantly make difference in the country's uh, status in terms of social, environmental, and economic needs. Ethiopia is striving to finance climate actions proactively and persistently as means systematically addressing the economic challenges of the country. Accordingly, the government has invested over 82 million US dollars from 2011 to 2019, mobilized from domestic, bilateral, multilateral sources, as well as from international climate finance institutions on climate change mitigation and adaptation projects and programs in agriculture, energy, transport, industry, forest, urban development, and health sectors. Despite this investment, still, Ethiopia still needs to attract and mobilize a significant finance to support its climate-compatible development agenda. We still count on our partners to fulfill their commitments to developing countries and committing themselves 
for the new challenge of uh, setting new quantified finance goal in the coming years. We also strongly urge multilateral financial institutions to undergo a serious reform that fits for purpose for the needs and circumstances of developing uh, countries that, rather than fueling the historical debt accumulated on the shoulders of developing countries and mainly Africa. Our future depends on our decision now. Urgent action is needed in limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius to avoid worst impact. Eight years after its signature, ensuring the implementation of Paris Agreement is not an option again. As I conclude, I would like to assure you Ethiopia's unwavering commitment to work with our fellow Africans and other global partners to achieve our priorities and the long-term objective of making the planet comfortable for present and future generations. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, my dear sister. Another round of applause for President Zoude. Let me now take this opportunity to request Brahim Ghali, the President of Zaharawi Arab Republic. Your Excellency, you have the floor. قامة الرئيس سيد ويليام بن غروتو رئيس جمهورية كينيا ورئيس رؤساء الدول الحكم الإفريقية المعنية بتغيير المناخ فخامة السيد غزالي رئيس الاتحاد الإفريقي فخامة السيد موسى فكي رئيس مفوضية الاتحاد الإفريقي أصحاب الفخامة والمعالي رؤساء الدول والوفود الحضور الكريم يطيب لي بداية أن أعرب عن جزيل الشكر والتقدير لجمهورية كينيا حكومة وشعبا برئاسة فخامة السيد ويليام روتو على الدعوة الكريمة التي تلقيناها وعلى ما حظينا به من حسن الاستقبال وكرم الضيافة وعلى ما وفرته لنا من ظروف لإنجاح هذا الاستحقاق قمة المناخ الإفريقية على غرار الكثير من بلدان العالم تقف الجمهورية الصحراوية على خط المواجهة في أزمة تغير المناخ وإذ نواجه تلك التحديات المرتبطة بالتغيير المناخي فإننا نخوض في الوقت نفسه نضالاً باسلا في سبيل إنهاء الاستعمار من بلادنا جراء وضع الاحتلال الناجم عن النزاع بين الجمهورية الصحراوية والمملكة المغربية وهي تحديات مرتبطة ومتداخلة فهذا الوضع تسبب في نزوح أكثر من 200 ألف مواطن صحراوي إلى مناطق إلى مناطق قاسية مناخيا إذ تصل درجات درجة الحرارة في مخيمات اللاجئين إلى مستويات قياسية وفي الأراضي المحتلة من الجمهورية الصحراوية فإن ممارسات الاحتلال التي تتم خارج القانون الدولي بلا حسيب ولا رقيب ومن قبيل الاستيطان والتصنيع وتطوير الآليات والنهب في مجال الصيد البحري واستنزاف الموارد المائية والفلاحية لغرض التصدير تفاقم من تأثيرات تغير المناخ كما يتسبب جدار الاحتلال العسكري الذي يقسم بلادنا إلى قسمين في حرمان الأراضي المحررة من الجمهورية الصحراوية من المياه وهو ما يشكل تدهوراً بيئياً خطيراً يزيد من آثار الجفاف 
الذي تعانيه المنطقة ذلك أنه أدى إلى تغييرات عميقة في سطح الأرض التي أصبحت أكثر عرضة للتعرية الريحية وركود المياه وقد زاد هذا الوضع من ظاهرة التصحر كما أن المناطق كما أن المناطق الملغومة المحاذية للجدار أصبحت مناطق غير صالحة للسكن وذات إنتاجية اقتصادية محدودة إن تلك التحديات الجمة تطلبت منا اتخاذ إجراءات عملية تتلائم مع الوضع القائم وفي هذا السياق طورت الجمهورية الصحراوية مساهمتها المحددة وطنيا NDC التي تحدد الإجراءات الملحة للتكيف مع التغير المناخي والتخفيف من حدته من خلال تعزيز التنمية القائمة على الطاقة المتجددة بدل من الطاقة الأحفورية وقد تم تدعيم المساهمة NDC بخطة التكيف الوطنية NAP من خلال المبادرات الوزارية المشتركة التي شملت عديد الوزارات وفي مخيمات اللاجئين الصحراويين قامت الجمهورية الصحراوية بتطوير أنظمة زراعية تقتصد في استخدام المياه كما قامت بتطوير أساليب, حدي أساليب حديثة ومنخفضة التكلفة لبناء المنازل بهدف مواجهة الأخطار المتزايدة للفيضانات إضافة إلى انتشار استخدام الطاقة الشمسية صغيرة الحجم وفي الأراضي المحررة تمت تجربة مشاريع مد المناطق الريفية بالكهرباء اعتمادا على الطاقة الشمسية وطاقة الرياح وإنشاء أنظمة الطاقة الشمسية لدعم المرافق الطبية في المناطق النائية والمعزولة السيد الرئيس على الرغم من الطبيعة الصحراوية لبلادنا إلا أن لنا الكثير لنقدمه, لنقدمه للاقتصاد الأزرق في إفريقيا فسواحلنا الأطلسية تعد موطنا لمصايد الأسماك الوفيرة كما يضم الشريط الساحلي لأراضي الجمهورية الصحراوية الممتد على مسافة 1110 كيلومتر مناطق رطبة رطبة مهمة بما فيها أربعة مواقع معترف بها بموجب اتفاقيات رامسار الدولية للحفاظ على الاستخدام المستدام للمناطق الرطبة وهي واد الساقية بجدور خليج الداخلة وسبخة إمليلي ورغم أن كل هذه الموارد تتعرض للتأثير التغير لتأثير لتأثيرات التغير المناخي جراء جراء الاستغلال المفرط البشع الذي تتعرض له تحت الاحتلال إلا أن الجمهورية الصحراوية تسجل التزامها بخطط التسيير الحصيفة في مجال في هذا المجال بما ينسجم مع المبادرات الإفريقية وأهدافها في الحفاظ على السواحل والأراضي الرطبة في قارتنا وفي العالم إضافة إلى العمل على ضمان خطط إدارية للمواقع ذات الأهمية البيئية بما يراعي متطلبات التغير المناخي ستعمل الجمهورية الصحراوية على إقامة شركات مع البلدان والمنظمات الإفريقية الأخرى لبناء قدراتنا الوطنية وتبادل الخبرات ذات الصلة بالاقتصاد الأزرق إن تأخر الأمم المتحدة في استكمال عملية تصفية الاستعمار من الصحراء الغربية آخر مستعمرة في إفريقيا لا يمكن أن يكون مبررا لعدم انخراط الجمهورية الصحراوية 
الكامل في المجهود العالمي للتصدي للتغير المناخي وأثاره, وآثاره المدمرة فمن غير المعقول أن, أن تحرم بلادي من الحصول على التمويلات المرصودة لمواجهة أزمات تغير المناخ ولا من الدعم الفني عبر آليات تمويل المناخ التابعة للأمم المتحدة وغيرها خيرا لا يمكن حرمان الجمهورية الصحراوية من حقها وواجبها في المساهمة مع إفريقيا والعالم في المعركة الوجودية كل هذا ناهيك عن تقاسم تجربة بلادنا الخاصة المكتسبة خلال عقود من التعايش مع الظروف المناخية القاسية مع الشعوب والأمم الأخرى ومن هنا تأتي ضرورة تمثيل الطرف الصحراوي في اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة الإطارية بشأن تغير المناخ وفي مؤتمر الأطراف الموقع الموقعة عليها كوبس وضرورة توقيع الطرف الصحراوي على اتفاقية باريس للمشاركة في المفاوضات وتقديم مساهمتها المحددة وطنيا بشكل دوري إلى مكتب أمانة اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة الإطارية بشأن تغير المناخ فالصوت الصحراوي سيكون صوتا إفريقيا مضافا ومعززا لموقف الإفريقي ترتبط التنمية المستدامة وإدارة الاقتصاد الأزرق في إفريقيا ارتباطا وثيقا بكيفية استجابتنا لتحدي تغير المناخ والجمهورية الصحراوية على أتم الاستعداد للمساهمة مع شقائها الأفارقة ومع دول العالم لتحقيق أفضل النتائج كل التوفيق والنجاح لأشغال القمة قمة وشكرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Thank you very much, Your Excellency Gali, for that statement. Now it's my humble duty to request His Excellency Evarist Ndaishimie, President of Burundi, to make his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Ruto. <laughs> na hongera sana kwa maandalizi mazuri ya mkutano huyo d'abord rendre grâce à Dieu le tout puissant qui nous a donné ce beau continent immense et riche d'opportunités de développement votre excellence monsieur William Samuel Ruto président de la république du Kenya notre hôte, Excellence, Messieurs, Mesdames, Messieurs, les chefs d'État et de gouvernement ici présents, Mesdames, Messieurs, les représentants des organisations internationales et régionales, Mesdames, Messieurs, en vos rangs et qualités respectives, à l'entame de mes propos, permettez-moi de remercier le président Samuel Ruto le gouvernement et le peuple kenyan pour l'accueil chaleuré réservé à notre endroit. Je félicite également le gouvernement kenyan et l'Union africaine pour l'excellente organisation de ce sommet qui arrive au point nommé. Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs, le changement climatique est actuellement l'une des plus grandes menaces collectives pour l'humanité. Au Burundi, les impacts du changement climatique, principalement la sécheresse, les pluies torrentielles, les vents violents, les inondations et les glissements de terrain, sont les principaux facteurs de déplacement interne. À cela s'ajoute l'augmentation du niveau des eaux du lac Tanganyika, les canicules insupportables, la dégradation croissante des terres qui pousse les familles à se disputer, l'opé de terres fertiles restantes, etc. 
D'après les résultats de la cartographie multi risque au Burundi, la perte annuelle moyenne nationale due aux cinq aléas majeurs est estimée à environ 100 millions de dollars. Dans ces pertes, 72% gênent des inondations, 5% des pluies torrentielles et 4% des vents violents. Ainsi, ces aléas occasionnent annuellement une perte moyenne de plus de 70 millions de dollars. Cela impacte le bien-être des populations et leur quiétude, provoque la destruction de l'habitat humain et des infrastructures, la prolifération des maladies et parfois la perte en vie humaine. Ces 20 dernières années, les mille et une collines du Burundi, jadis verdoyantes, sont exposées aux effets du changement climatique. Le Burundi était habitué à avoir, à avoir une pluviométrie de neuf mois, mais aujourd'hui la sécheresse commence à dépasser les quatre mois, avec un calendrier inhabituel dans la succession et le rythme des saisons, ce qui affecte le rendement de la production agricole et animale. Au regard de cette situation, le Burundi a multiplié diverses initiatives pour y faire face. En effet, le Burundi s'aligne à toutes les conventions internationales relatives au changement climatique. À cet égard, le Burundi s'est doté d'un code de l'environnement en 2021 et l'une des politiques d'orientation environnementale, agricole et d'élevage tenant compte du changement climatique. Ce programme s'accompagne de la mobilisation des agriculteurs à mettre en avant la plantation des arbres fertilitaires, en plus du traçage des courbes de niveau pour retenir des eaux de pluie. Le Burundi a préparé et révisé en 2020 ses contributions déterminées au niveau national pour rendre opérationnel l'accord de Paris. Un plan national d'adaptation a été également adopté conformément au paragraphe 9 de l'article 4 de l'accord de Paris. Dans la même optique, au niveau pratique, au niveau pratique le Burundi implique et mobilise régulièrement les jeunes en vacances dans la préparation des, des pépinières d'arbres forestiers, forestiers et agroforestiers et à planter pendant les, les campagnes de reboisement qui se font chaque année dans le cadre d'un vaste programme Ewe Burundi Rambaye, le Burundi couvert initié depuis 2018 dans le but de réhabiliter les zones forestières dégradées. Excellence, Mesdames, Messieurs, le Burundi ambitionne de devenir un pays émergent d'ici 2040 et développé en 2060. Un des objectifs de développement comprend la protection de l'environnement et le renforcement de la résilience au changement climatique. Dans cette perspective, plusieurs projets sont en cours et d'autres sont envisagés pour réaliser un développement économique sobre, en carbone et résilient au changement climatique. Nous pouvons citer, entre autres, la mise en place des agropoles, des centres hydroélectriques et photovoltaïques, les énergies renouvelables, la gestion efficace des déchets, l'extension du programme national de reboisement, le développement de l'agriculture intelligente par des innovations technologiques adaptées au contexte agricole et géographique, et cela s'accompagnera par la réduction de l'utilisation de bois de chauffage dans les ménages en promouvant d'autres moyens de substitution tels que la tourbe, le gaz naturel et le biogaz. Et cela, mesdames, messieurs, comme vous le savez, l'Afrique supporte le poids des impacts du changement climatique, bien qu'elle contribue à moins de 4% des émissions mondiales 
de gaz à effet de serre et que sa responsabilité historique soit négligeable. C'est le moment ici de lancer un appel vibrant aux pays développés de respecter leur engagement pris lors du sommet sur le climat à Paris en 2015 en libérant les 100 milliards par an en faveur des pays en développement pour atténuer les changements climatiques et soutenir les efforts de transition verte, de croissance verte de notre économie. Pour conclure, nous réitérons notre attachement à l'accord de Paris, à la stratégie et au plan d'action 2022-2032 de l'Afrique en matière de changement climatique et de développement résilient. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for your comments. Another round of applause for President Evaris Daishimi. Let me now take this opportunity to request uh, the Vice President of Angola, my dear sister, to come and make her statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellencia William Samu Ruto, President of the Republic of Kenya. Excellencia Sr. Azali Asumani, President in exercise of the Union African. Excellencia Sr. Musafak, President of the Commission of the Union African. Excellencia Primeiras damas, distintos convidados, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, todo o protocolo observado. Permitam-me, Excelências, apresentar em primeiro lugar os cumprimentos de Sua Excelência João Manel Gonçalves Lourenço, Presidente da República de Angola, a quem tenho a elevada honra de representar nesta magna cimeira com a participação dos Estados-membros, no sentido de contribuir efetivamente para a identificação de soluções duráveis que respondam aos desafios globais relacionados com o clima no nosso continente. Aproveitamos igualmente para felicitar o Governo do Quênia pelo excelente acolhimento proporcionado a mim e à delegação que me acompanha. Saudamos também a União Africana por esta importante iniciativa, bem como felicitamos Sua Excelência William Ruto, Presidente da República do Quênia, como coordenador do Comitê de Chefes de Estado e de Governos Africanos para as Alterações Climáticas, incentivando os Estados-membros a contribuírem para o processo de transformação econômica verde do continente e na otimização dos recursos humanos e naturais, bem como na adaptação e na mitigação às alterações climáticas. Excelências, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, há cerca de meio século o ambiente foi colocado no centro do desenvolvimento e do bem-estar humano e a semelhança de outras regiões... A África tem sido fortemente afetada por choques globais múltiplos, incluindo condições financeiras restritivas a nível global, perturbações nas cadeias de abastecimento, dos impactos cada vez mais crescentes das alterações climáticas e de eventos climáticos extremos, como inundações e secas severas, constituindo uma ameaça às economias africanas, revelando um impacto negativo na concretização dos diferentes programas nacionais e no alcance dos Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, excelências, o Presidente da República de Angola 
João Manuel Gonçalves Lourenço dá prioridade às questões das alterações climáticas através do Programa Nacional de Desenvolvimento Sustentável 2022-2027, que define como prioridades a segurança alimentar, a agricultura familiar, o desenvolvimento local, a adaptação às alterações climáticas, a educação, a saúde para maior desenvolvimento do capital humano, a criação de empregos inclusivos, mas também a modernização e expansão das infraestruturas, tanto rodoviárias como portuárias, e polos industriais, para apoio à diversificação da economia e ao crescimento sustentável. A África é um continente de oportunidades, onde as mulheres e a juventude são os maiores produtores de alimentos e constituem cerca de 70% do potencial produtivo. Por isso, têm de ser financiadas as iniciativas e projetos que os envolvem em atividades de grande valor do agronegócio. Precisamos de financiar o emprego verde para os jovens, de modo a ampliar cada vez mais a adaptação a resiliência das nossas comunidades e promover o desenvolvimento sustentável. Angola está totalmente comprometida com a implementação da Convenção Quadro das Nações Unidas para as Alterações Climáticas. Por esta razão, temos elaborado políticas e programas de ação como a Estratégia Nacional para as Alterações Climáticas 2022-2035, uma estratégia que pretende dar resposta aos desafios lançados pelo Acordo de Paris e pelos Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável das Agenda 2030 e estabelecer a visão da política nacional angolana no horizonte 2035. Por iniciativa própria, a República de Angola está a desenvolver um programa energético diversificado que hoje incentiva a transição energética com energias limpas e renováveis, com a entrada em funcionamento de dois projetos, que são os painéis fotovoltaicos com cerca de 285 megawatts, o que irá reduzir o impacto da emissão de dióxido de carbono em cerca de 935 mil toneladas a ano. Estando ainda em conclusão a construção de mais cinco parques fotovoltaicos em outras províncias do país. Em termos de adaptação às alterações climáticas, estamos a implementar ações de mitigação dos efeitos da seca no sul de Angola. Com esforços endógenos, o país investiu mais de 130 milhões de dólares americanos para a construção do canal do CAF, uma infraestrutura que vai permitir levar água para as populações afetadas pela seca, bem como para a prática da agricultura, aumentando assim a resiliência das nossas comunidades rurais. Excelências, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, reconhecemos que o caminho que está sendo trilhado é longo. No que diz respeito às soluções tecnológicas inovadoras para os desafios ambientais, o consumo e produção sustentáveis, que como não poderia deixar de ser, nos coloca alinhados com o posicionamento do grupo africano que tem levado a cabo grandes iniciativas com vista a honrar os compromissos assumidos internacionalmente, com forte empenho no aumento de até cerca de 70% de fontes de energias renováveis até 2025. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, os danos e as perdas em África como consequência das alterações climáticas são elevados. Criam instabilidade social, criam deslocações forçadas da população, agudizam conflitos. Angola apela por isso à promoção de uma parceria global mais justa e mais equitativa. Angola considera 
que os investimentos em projetos climáticos em África não beneficiam apenas as nações africanas, contribuem para a estabilidade climática global. Devemos agir rapidamente. Ao terminar, agradeço por todos os esforços dedicados a esta cimeira e reafirmo o compromisso inabalável de Angola com a igualdade, com a resiliência e com todo o processo de progresso da nossa amada África. Reitero a nossa confiança na União Africana e na comunidade internacional para enfrentarmos os desafios climáticos. Unidos, podemos superar os obstáculos, construir um futuro mais brilhante para as nossas populações, para a África e para o mundo. Muito obrigada. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. Another round of applause for Angola. Thank you very much. Let me now take this opportunity with all humility to ask President Ismail Omar Guela, the President of Djibouti, to make his statement. Your Excellency. Monsieur le Président, William Ruto, Président de la République du Kenya, Mesdames et Messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général des Nations Unies, Mesdames et Messieurs, Qu'il me soit tout, tout d'abord permis de remercier le président de la République du Kenya, William Ruto, et le peuple frère Kenyan pour l'accueil chaleureux qui nous a été réservé depuis notre arrivée dans cette belle ville de Nairobi. C'est pour moi un réel plaisir de prendre part à ce forum qui s'inscrit dans une démarche de réflexion stratégique, de dialogue, d'échange en vue du développement durable de notre continent à travers le potentiel qu'offre l'économie bleue. La République de Djibouti s'est souscrit totalement à la déclaration de Moroni et à la stratégie de coordination en vue d'un mécanisme pour les pays côtiers qui, à eux seuls, englobent près de 13 millions de kilomètres carrés de territoire océanique. Mon pays étant un pays désertique, sévèrement impacté par le changement climatique ces derniers temps, l'économie bleue c'est depuis longtemps naturellement imposé à nous. C'est pourquoi le secteur primaire ne représente que 3% du PIB, alors que le secteur tertiaire occupe 87%, grâce aux activités portuaires, maritimes et logistiques. Notre position géostratégique nous offre par ailleurs un atout très important dans le secteur portuaire et le trafic maritime international. En outre, pour lutter contre le spectre de la soif, le dessalement de l'eau de mer nous a permis de résoudre le problème de l'accès à l'eau potable et Djibouti a réalisé sa première usine de dessalement de l'eau de mer. C'est pour vous dire que favoriser le développement de l'économie bleue est un impératif pour Djibouti. Et c'est dans cet esprit que nous avons élaboré une stratégie nationale pour l'économie bleue au cours de l'année 
dont la vision nationale et les principes directeurs guideront l'action du gouvernement. De ses partenaires, et de la société civile dans les domaines maritimes et côtiers. Il en est de même pour la région de l'IGAD qui a élaboré une stratégie quinquennale, ainsi qu'un plan de mise en œuvre pour l'économie bleue, tous deux alignés sur la stratégie pour l'économie bleue en Afrique. La vision de la stratégie de l'IGAD pour l'économie bleue est une économie inclusive, et durable qui pourra contribuer de manière significative à la transformation de la corne de l'Afrique. Les autres secteurs identifiés, outre les activités portuaires et maritimes, sont la pêche et l'aquaculture, le tourisme et la sécurité maritime. De plus, les technologies de pointe, telles que l'énergie renouvelable, et les télécommunications à travers les câbles sous-marins permettent au pays d'accéder à de nouvelles ressources. Monsieur le Président, les océans transcendent les États, ils nous connectent tous les uns, tous les uns aux autres, et nous devons exploiter ces liens pour le développement et pas seulement pour l'enrichissement. C'est là l'essentiel de ce que signifie développer une économie bleue, c'est créer des partenariats qui nous permettent d'exploiter nos océans pour un changement de paradigme en termes d'action vers le développement durable. Pour cela, la stratégie de l'économie bleue doit reposer sur trois principes. Le renforcement de la croissance économique des activités maritimes traditionnelles et émergentes, la sauvegarde des, des ressources naturelles et des services écosystèmes, écosystémiques, la création d'emplois durables et la préservation des moyens de subsistance. Nous devons veiller à ce que nos océans créent des opportunités pour nos populations. Plus de 80% de la population djiboutienne vit dans les zones côtières. C'est pourquoi nous pensons que l'inclusion, l'appropriation et l'autonomisation des populations côtières sont des éléments essentiels de la mise en œuvre de l'économie bleue avant de, passer, de penser aux, aux, aux chaînes d'approvisionnement mondial. Nous devons garantir la capacité locale de légitimer, de réglementer et de créer des opportunités. Monsieur le Président, la prise de conscience croissante des avantages des océans pour nos économies et nos sociétés associée à la prise de conscience des multiples menaces, notamment la surexploitation des ressources maritimes, des ressources marines, la population, la pollution marine, le changement climatique et l'acidification des océans déclenchent une dynamique accrue en faveur d'un meilleur système de protection et d'utilisation durable des ressources marines. La préservation et la protection de nos océans, de océans garantira la durabilité de notre planète. Mais cette préservation doit également s'accompagner d'actions, à savoir lutter contre les inégalités et les pratiques néfastes qui entachent la gouvernance des océans. La pêche illégale, la pêche industrielle commerciale illimitée et non durable, le déversement illégal des déchets toxiques sont autant de risques énormes notre planète. Cette conférence doit donc marquer le point de départ d'une nouvelle trajectoire de développement pour nos océans et nos mers. Nous sommes conscients du potentiel africain quant à l'économie bleue, mais également de nos vulnérabilités. 
libérer le potentiel d'une économie bleue régénératrice en Afrique et au-delà exige la mobilisation des moyens financiers adéquats. Car les capacités de nos États à tirer profit de nos ressources économiques bleues restent insuffisantes. En dépit de nombreux engagements pris par la communauté internationale en matière d'adaptation au changement climatique et augmenter la résilience, nos actions restent en deçà du niveau d'urgence et de mobilisation exigée. C'est pourquoi l'Afrique continue à exhorter nos partenaires développés à respecter leur engagement, surtout car le développement de l'économie bleue s'inscrit parfaitement dans cet esprit de durabilité et de résilience prôné par l'agenda 2030 des Nations Unies et constitue une bouffée de sauvetage pour notre continent et particulièrement les pays désertiques. Je vous remercie. Another round of applause for President Ismail Omar of Djibouti. Let me now this, to take this opportunity to invite the Vice President of Namibia. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Your Excellency, President William Ruto, President of the Republic of Kenya, Your Excellency Musa Faki Mahamat, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Your Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Your Excellency's Head of State and Government, Ministers, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to extend warm greetings from the Republic of Namibia, specifically from Dr. Hage Gottfried Geingo, President of the Republic of Namibia, to you, President William Ruto, for your excellent leadership in the fight against climate change and for hosting this very important and timely summit on climate change. I further extend my gratitude to you and to the people of Kenya for the excellent way this summit has been organized and the warm hospitality extended to my delegation since our arrival in this beautiful city of Nairobi. As your Excellency have said, I'm finally happy to have returned home to East Africa. Today I wish to shed light on the effect and impact of climate change on Namibia and her people. Namibia's geographical location in southwest corner of Africa with its vast desert landscape and arid climate make it particularly vulnerable to the impact of climate change. Rising temperatures, erratic rainfall patterns, and prolonged droughts are becoming more frequent and tense, wreaking havoc on the country's economy, on our environments, and of course, affecting our people. 
agriculture, a cornerstone on Namibia's economy, is significantly affected. Prolonged droughts and unpredictable rain patterns lead to the reduced crop yields, livestock losses, and increased vulnerability to food insecurity. As a result, farmers struggle to provide for their families and to contribute to the nation's food production. The impact on rural communities is thus severe, exacerbating poverty and inequality. Moreover, climate change exacerbates the water scarcity challenges facing our country. With limited fresh, fresh water resources and a growing population, the demand for water is increasingly high. However, as temperature rise and rainfall becomes erratic, rivers and water bodies dry up and groundwater reserves deplete. This scarcity not only affects drinking water availability, but also impact on agriculture, industrial activities, and hydropower generation. The water crisis strains communities, hinders economic development, and threatens social and communal stabilities. Your Excellencies, these challenges are not unique only to Namibia, as they whole continent experience similar, if not worse, consequences of climate change. We need to be clear in our message to the international community as it relates to what some refer to as climate injustice or climate justice. The global response to the effect of climate change in Africa should be characterized by agency, collaboration, and support. Africa, as a continent, is particularly vulnerable to the impact of climate change, despite contributing minimally to global greenhouse gas emissions. Developed nations must fulfill their commitment to provide financial and technical assistance to African countries. Adequate funding is crucial to support adaptation and mitigation efforts, improving infrastructural resilience and promote sustainable development. Technology transfer and capacity building initiatives can empower African nations to implement climate friendly solutions and maximize their potential for clean energy generation and sustainable agriculture. As Africans, we need a stronger voice, unity, and wield more international influence to bring around the necessary change on the continent for the betterment of our people if we want to realize, and I quote, the Africa we want, in line with Agenda 2063. By working together, we can build a more resilient Africa, mitigate the impact of climate change, and ensure a sustainable future for the continent and all its people. I am therefore positive that through the Nairobi Declaration, we send a clear message to international community, and especially to our partners present here at this conference, that the time to act is now. Merci beaucoup, obligation, obrigado, thank you all, asante sana. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Now it's my opportunity to request the Vice President of Colombia, my sister, to come and make her remarks. Your Excellency, Madam Vice President.
she is the first woman of color to be vice president of Colombia. Welcome. Buenas tardes. Un saludo al presidente de la República de Kenia, William Ruto. Saludo al, ex al ex el excelente presidente de Comoros, a Salí Asumani, a su excelencia Moussa Faki, presidente de la Comisión de la Unión Africana, secretario general de las Naciones Unidas, Antonio Guterres, a todos los presidentes, mandatarios, ministros, medios de comunicación y en general que se encuentran aquí presentes. En primer lugar, quiero agradecer Presidente Ruto, por haber invitado a Colombia a participar de esta gran cumbre sobre el clima aquí en este continente africano. Vengo en delegación del presidente Gustavo Petro, quien fue invitado de manera personal por el presidente de Kenia. Decirle gracias por colocar la discusión central que hoy nos llama como humanidad a atender los grandes desafíos, sobre todo este desafío planetario que pone en riesgo y está extinguiendo todos los días la vida en el planeta. Como una mujer afrodescendiente estoy orgullosa de estar aquí en el continente madre, de aquí salieron mis ancestros y ancestras en condición de esclavitud y hoy yo regreso en condición de libertad como vicepresidenta. Y eso quiere decir que hemos hecho una apuesta por la libertad, por la justicia y por la dignidad como pueblos. Me honra estar aquí entonces haciendo parte de esta discusión tan importante y es el desafío que tenemos y que afronta, afrontan nuestras naciones frente al cambio climático. Como ustedes han dicho, África es la voz del planeta, pero también es la cuna de la humanidad. Y me alegra saber que hoy África, siendo la cuna de la humanidad, está dando líneas de cómo salvaguardar la casa grande, de cómo salvaguardar el planeta. Sin embargo, es necesario que esa voz se pueda extender al sur global. Hoy aquí América Latina está presente, el Caribe está presente, porque estamos sufriendo los mismos desafíos. En mi país, este año de gobierno, hemos tenido que afrontar una crisis muy fuerte en términos de los efectos del cambio climático. Hemos tenido inundaciones que han puesto en riesgo la vida de los más vulnerables. Pero ahora tenemos una sequía que está iniciando y que, por supuesto, va a poner en riesgo la vida humana y, por supuesto, la vida de ecosistemas frágiles que hacen parte de ese gran pulmón del mundo como es la Amazonía y la región pacífica, así como sabemos acá hay otra parte de ese pulmón del mundo que es todo el, el Congo, la región del Congo estratégico para la, el, garantizar el equilibrio. En ese sentido, el presidente Gustavo Petro ha hecho varias propuestas al mundo, las hizo en Naciones Unidas, y hoy esas propuestas se colocan sobre la mesa. Todo lo que aquí se ha dicho sobre cómo asumir la policrisis, las distintas crisis que estamos viviendo. Crisis del hambre, crisis migratoria, 
crisis en términos de la salud y la pandemia es una evidencia de esa crisis planetaria y de las múltiples crisis que para mí deriva de los, del impacto al planeta, derivan del cambio climático. Y en ese sentido entonces, los países de renta media o los países vulnerables son los que están sufriendo las mayores consecuencias, como aquí lo, ya lo han dicho en reiteradas ocasiones, no somos los mayores responsables de las emisiones, pero sí estamos sufriendo las mayores consecuencias. Y aquí el problema es de financiamiento, de cómo financiamos las acciones que estamos desarrollando en nuestros países y en nuestras regiones. El problema real es financiero, no es falta de voluntad política de hacer. El problema de fondo es que no contamos con los recursos suficientes para atender este desafío planetario. Y acompañamos entonces la propuesta que aquí ha hecho el presidente de una nueva reforma de la estructura del sistema financiero. No podemos atender esta crisis con las mismas reglas y normas del sistema financiero internacional, que por cierto tienen una visión colonial, donde los más ricos se sostienen en su economía a base de la explotación de los más empobrecidos. Esa visión colonial no nos va a permitir hoy hacer frente a la situación que tenemos. Por tanto, nosotros proponemos el canje de deuda para la acción climática. Ese canje de deuda, por supuesto, tampoco puede ser de la manera tradicional en como se ha hecho, porque ahí no habría una, re, una relación de justa. No tendríamos las condiciones para hacer un canje con las situaciones económicas y financieras de nuestros países. Ese canje de deuda, por supuesto, implica una condición especial. Y una de esas propuestas es que hagamos un acuerdo multilateral para trabajar en esa transformación de ese sistema financiero, pero además construyamos juntos en el marco de ese acuerdo multilateral un plan de acción urgente. El planeta no da tiempo, ya no tenemos tiempo para seguir hablando, nos toca ir a la acción y esto pasa por la voluntad política de los países del norte, del G20, que sigue emitiendo gases de efecto invernadero. No es suficiente con que realicemos acciones en el sur global si el norte global no asume el desafío de frenar las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero, como ya lo decía el secretario general de la ONU hace un rato. En tal sentido, entonces, Proponemos que se haga lo mismo que se hizo con la pandemia y es que el Fondo Monetario Internacional emita bonos especiales ¿sí? para que ello contribuya a conformar un gran fondo global que nos permita a los países de renta media y vulnerable tener las condiciones económicas ¿sí? que afronte este desafío. Sin eso no es posible avanzar sin ese compromiso de reformar el sistema financiero. Nuestros países van a seguir estando ahogados, sobreendeudándose y peor, sin dar respuestas reales a nuestras poblaciones que hoy se mueren. Como mujer celebro que en este espacio 
en esta cumbre se esté colocando el papel tan importante que asumimos las mujeres en la política para la vida, en esa política de usar nuestro amor maternal y nuestro instinto del cuidado para salvaguardar la madre tierra, el útero mayor. Gracias por la invitación y reitero, Colombia expresa su compromiso frente al cambio climático y expresa su compromiso para fortalecer una relación sur-sur con el continente africano, con el Caribe, que nos permita, como ya lo han planteado aquí, dar respuestas concretas, específicas y contundente a este desafío planetario. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, my sister Francia, for that candid statement. And by the way, Francia has a Kenyan name. She's called Nyawira. And uh, when she came to Kenya, we traced her origin to a place called Meru. So um, thank you very much, Nyawira. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. A round of applause for Nyawira Francia. Thank you very much. Now, let me take this opportunity to request my brother, the Prime Minister from DRC, to make his uh, comments briefly because we've really overshot the runway. Your Excellency, please. Excellence William Ruto, président de la République du Kenya et hôte du présent sommet. Leurs excellences, mesdames et messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, Monsieur Antonio Guterres, secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Madame Ursula von der Leyen, président de la Commission de l'Union européenne, Monsieur Moussafaki Mahamat, président de la Commission de l'Union africaine, distingués invités, Mesdames et Messieurs, c'est un grand honneur pour moi de prendre la parole ce jour au nom de Son Excellence Félix Antoine Tshisekedi Chilombo, président de la République démocratique du Congo et chef de l'État, à l'occasion du Sommet africain sur le climat qui se tient dans ce magnifique cadre du Centre international des conférences Kenyatta ici à Nairobi. Avant toute chose, comme mes prédécesseurs, je tiens à remercier la République du Kenya, République Sœur, pour l'accueil qui a été réservé à ma délégation. Et ces remerciements, je les donne au nom de Son Excellence, Monsieur le Président de la République, Félix Antoine Tshisekedi Chilombo. Organisé sous le thème « Développer des solutions positives pour le climat en faveur de l'Afrique et du monde », ce sommet offre à mon pays l'opportunité de répondre aux attentes que le monde se fait sur la problématique du climat et dont les préceptes se fondent essentiellement sur trois piliers fondamentaux, à savoir l'économie verte, la biodiversité et les énergies renouvelables. Comme on ne se sera jamais de le dire, la République démocratique du Congo se présente dans ce contexte comme un pays solution. Solution aux défis qui se posent à notre monde, de par son potentiel et de ses atouts innombrables qui constituent un apport indéniable à la préservation et à la conservation de la nature. Disposant des écosystèmes favorables, mon pays regorge d'un massif forestier important, protecteur de la couche d'ozone, d'environ 155,5 millions d'hectares, soit 10% des forêts tropicales de la planète et plus de 60% des forêts du bassin du Congo, en plus d'importantes réserves et tourbières, puis de, de, de plus de 30 gigatonnes de dioxyde de carbone, sans compter son potentiel photovoltaïque 
de plus de 70 000 MW, euh, qui représente environ 37% du potentiel africain et 6% du potentiel mondial. La République démocratique du Congo est en mesure de produire, euh, à travers son système hydrologique, plus de 100 000 MW pouvant alimenter l'Afrique et une partie de l'Europe, sans compter sur euh, sa jeunesse, euh, sa main d'œuvre, euh, qui est aussi un grand potentiel. Mais comme le président Ruto l'a dit ici euh, tout à l'heure, le potentiel africain, il est connu. Ici, il est question de transformer ce potentiel en opportunité et en répondant sur les questions du climat. Nous avons eu ici l'année passée euh, une crise du fait des dérèglements des pluies et des saisons sèches qui ont amené une récolte maigre en maïs. Nous avons connu, tant en Afrique de l'Est qu'en Afrique, cent qu Afrique centrale et même en Afrique australe, des hausses de prix de maïs. Et cela a déstabilisé nos économies. Cela nous rend plus conscients de la réponse que nous devons donner à cette réponse du climat. Pour moi, et en réponse de la République démocratique du Congo, trois ingrédients indispensables sont importants. La volonté, la solidarité et la détermination. La volonté, à travers le respect des engagements que nous prenons, particulièrement les pays pollueurs, en ce qui concerne la taxe carbone comme convenu lors de la COP15. La volonté sur les financements innovants, des économies vertes, telles qu'échangées lors du sommet de Paris dernier. La volonté sur les investissements sur l'énergie, les développements des chaînes de valeur ici en Afrique, et cela avec une réponse à l'emploi, à nos jeunes. Et la volonté de nous permettre, et cela a été dit aussi ici, d'accès à des financements, à des conditions équitables et justes. Mais permettre également la réduction des dettes des économies vulnérables post-Covid-19. Réduction de ces dettes par compensation, parce que ça avait déjà été aussi proposé, et je pense que ça mérite d'être rappelé. Il faut, deuxième ingrédient, de la solidarité, solidarité sur les projets d'intérêt commun. Je pense ici à des projets énergétiques, énergie verte, qui peuvent répondre à ce besoin en énergie pour ces populations qui vivent de nos forêts. Je pense ici au barrage de Inga, qui est un projet intégrateur et pour lequel nous sommes ouverts à ce que nous puissions avoir l'effort de tous sur ce type de projet. Je peux donner un autre exemple d'accord entre la République démocratique du Congo et la Zambie sur le développement des chaînes de valeur des batteries. La solidarité sur les questions d'intérêt commun, comme c'est le cas de celle du bassin du Congo, du bassin de l'Amazonie et celle du Mekong, tel que cela a été rappelé ici par le président Denis Sassou La solidarité sur les questions de paix et de sécurité pour garantir la protection des forêts et la biodiversité détruites par les guerres et le braconnage. La solidarité face aux pays les plus impactés par le dérèglement climatique. Thank you. La détermination, troisième ingrédient, dans la recherche continue des solutions innovantes aux questions du climat comme c'est ici le cas au Kenya. Également, la détermination à laisser un monde meilleur à nos enfants. La République démocratique du Congo s'inscrit également dans une nouvelle économie du climat, ainsi sur euh, axé sur euh, la conservation et la restauration de nos forêts et tourbières pour plus de production de crédit carbone, mais aussi l'agriculture euh, régénérative, 
pour répondre à la fois à la garantie de la survie de nos puits de carbone, mais aussi à la sécurité alimentaire. Et c'est pour cela que nous nous inscrivons dans la création d'un fonds d'investissement pour la nouvelle économie du climat. Mais aussi, nous faisons un plaidoyer, et cela, nous comptons le faire en marge de l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies, qui sera organisée le 19 septembre prochain, sur un marché de carbone équitable pour l'Afrique. Nous le ferons bien sûr en marge de ce sommet. Et donc, toutes ces questions sur lesquelles nous sommes solidaires, avec toutes les déclarations africaines qui ont été faites ici et même au-delà de l'Afrique. Et c'est pour ça que je remercie sincèrement le président Routo et tous les participants pour cette opportunité qui a été donnée à travers ce sommet et son plein succès, qui contribuera sans nul doute aux prochaines assises sur le climat. Je vous remercie tous. Aksan Tisan. Thank you very much, my brother Sama, for your comments. And um, another round of applause for my brother Sama. Let me ask um, that we now prepare the clip from my sister Motley. Just hold it. As I give the floor very briefly, maybe two, three minutes, to the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Salah Jama from Somalia, if he is there. Okay, if he's not there, can we take the clip from my sister Mia Motley? Your Excellency President Ruto of Kenya, Your Excellency Azal Asumani, President of Comoros and Chairperson of the African Union, I'd like to thank you for co-hosting such an important summit. Thank you also to Your Excellency UN Secretary General, my dear friend and brother Antonio Guterres, and to Presidents, Honorable Ministers and everyone present for contributing to this remarkable occasion. We are gathered here today for what is truly an important summit, not just for Africa, but for the entire world. And while I do wish I could join you in person today, please accept my participation by way of this message as I bring this from you from my own shores here in Barbados. President Ruto, you know that Kenya is one of my favorite places, and if I could be there, I would be there. My friends, so many people across the globe are now imperiled and impacted by the climate crisis and the interconnected impacts that's, that take place, such as pollution and deforestation. The world has discussed and debated all of this. But the fact is that for too long, we have done far too little. And as I said in Paris, we're not moving at the pace or with the scope that is necessary to tackle the environmental decline if we are to safeguard our people and our planet. The climate crisis affects everybody, but particularly it has devastating consequences, life and death consequences for the very poorest and most vulnerable and they come from countries who didn't help cause it. But my friends, we still have a choice. We can continue to talk amongst each other, seeking perfection or even casting blame while the world literally burns. Or we can choose to transform our future. We can choose to shape it. To do so, we've said all along, we need to take action now and at the pace and the scope that matters. And why with such urgency? We now live in a world of superlatives. I call it the season of superlatives, the hottest, the rainiest, the warmest. Everything is breaking new barriers and new records for the Guinness Book of World Records. And yet every day we continue to do nothing or enough as we see the impacts of the climate crisis. We need to stop talking and we need to do. The Bridgetown Initiative is an action plan that we've identified to make the world a better place only because we live in a world where capitalism and money dominate so much that unless we unlock the financing mechanisms, we're not going to be able to take the necessary action at scale and with speed. At its core, 
The Bridgetown Initiative sets out how we can rebuild the international financial architecture to be fit for purpose, so that countries like ours and yours are no longer disadvantaged by systems that were not built with us in mind when they were established. Now is the time to do what needs to be done. There's no other word, N-O-W, a simple three-letter word, now. We are at the crossroads for humanity. And this, my friends, is a time when political will, matched by the recognition of our reality, will make all the difference in the world. I know that many of us recognize this who are there today at this Africa Summit. Your countries and your people continue, like mine and ours in the Caribbean and across SIDS, to face the brutal effects of this climate crisis. And we also face, of course, that climate financing gap that is limiting your ability to respond effectively. This cannot and this should not be. Brothers and sisters, I say to you today that it is up to everyone to do all they can to ensure the continued health of our nations. We must work together from the African continent to the Caribbean. Understanding nature and the climate crisis does not respect the boundaries which man holds fast to his borders. Indeed, I say now it doesn't matter because we're seeing it in the north, in the east, the west and the south. We must stand up for what is right. We must share a sense of responsibility to our environment and indeed to the loss of biodiversity on land and in our oceans. We must share a sense of responsibility to each and every generation. We, my friends, are capable of achieving common goals, but we can only do so when we share that sense of responsibility to one another. We must be our brothers and sisters keepers, and we must look to treat others as we would wish to be treated. If we apply these simple precepts that our children live by daily, then I believe that we can begin to see success. I trust that the science will continue to be all at the center of all that we do, and I trust, therefore, that that ability to link science with finance, with public policy action, can make the difference to ordinary people in Nairobi, ordinary people in Bridgetown, ordinary people wherever they are found on this planet. Thank you, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you very much, my sister Motley, wherever you are, and for your very kind uh, comments. Uh, let me now take this opportunity to ask uh, the, pri the Deputy Prime Minister from Somalia, Mr. Jama, to make your statement, and I request my brother to make it brief. Thank you. Thank you for understanding. President? Your Excellency, President William Ruto, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, fellow leaders from Africa and around the world. On behalf of the President of Somalia, Dr. Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, and the people of Somalia, I would like to express our heartfelt thanks to the President of Kenya for convening this very timely inaugural African Climate Summit. Ladies and gentlemen, across the African continent, from the southern tip to the northern edge of the Sahara, from the Sahel to the Horn, the impact of climate change manifests itself in some very similar cyclical and destructive patterns. And it's this common threat that brings us all together to form a unified voice championed by President Ruto. Ladies and gentlemen, Somalia, located in the Horn of Africa, is acutely aware of the profound weight of climate change vulnerabilities. Rising temperatures are very common in Somalia, and the predictions state that by 2040, 2060, the temperature would increase by 1 to 1.7 degrees Celsius. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to highlight a set of variables that interact together and render the African states extremely vulnerable in their communities. The era of climate change has become synonymous with the nexus of food insecurity, forced migration, and displacement, compelled with conflict. 
it, is, it has been widely stated here today that over 150 million Africans are subject to food insecurity and hunger. Around 60 million of those are in the Eastern Africa and the Horn region, and 5 million in Somalia. Since much of the African countries are not industrial states, climate change impact affects us at our most vulnerable places. In places like Somalia, pastoral communities and agrarian communities are the most hard hit. So today's very proud livestock herder or a farmer could overnight find themselves in an IDB camp outside the big cities, becoming another added number to climate change vulnerabilities. I would like to allude to an element of combating climate change that has not been widely discussed in this uh, plenary today, and that is our coastlines and the blue economy that President Gailey spoke about. Somalia has the longest coastline in the mainland continent, but overall in Africa, our blue economy is underperforming and rising waters, water levels, uh, extinction of coral reefs and mangroves and biodiversity is an imminent threat for the ocean gives us more than 50% of the oxygen that we consume. Ladies and gentlemen, Somalia annually loses a revenue worth of 300 million to illegal fishing. And I think investment in the sector will allow us to enhance our potential to cope with climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, the final question I would like to raise is how well are the African states and societies situated to compact climate change? I think that point has been very well articulated by the previous speakers. The African states have a unique set of challenges that puts them in a precarious situation. Limited fiscal space, changing global markets and volatility, lack of access to finance at a reasonable rate, all these elements compounded, and the climate change divert the African states from investing in development and sustainable development goals, and on a regular basis focus on humanitarian interventions. Such an approach should be abandoned, and we must look for more meaningful engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, when droughts hit California, you do not see the death of people. But when droughts hit the Horn of Africa, you see both the death of people and the loss of livestock. So climate change affects Africa in some very profound and immediate ways. Finally, I fundamentally want to agree with the argument put forth by President Ruto that Africa should be and ought to be part of the solution to compact climate change. We have a very young, vibrant population. More than 70% of our population is young. We have 60% of the world's potential in terms of renewable energy. We have the greatest potential for agriculture and livestock. And instead of the world feeding us, Africa has the potential to feed the world. But for that to happen, there needs to be justice and reform in the global financial institution. If we cannot access finances at a reasonable rate, a rate equal to others, then for us bringing about a transformation would be an elusive goal. I'll give you the final example of where Somalia stands today. We are fighting a war against Al-Shabaab, Mr. President. That is why our president could not be here. He is in the front lines. We are finalizing a debt relief HIPIC initiative that took us almost a decade serious fiscal limitations. After we complete the fight against Al-Shabaab and we finish our debt relief program, we will find ourselves in a very interesting situation. Do we go for concessional loans to invest in infrastructure, in human capital, in sustainable development goals, or do we deal with the droughts? We almost averted a famine a year ago. 
Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, in the last 30 years, Somalia has experienced 18 droughts, two famines, and equal number of floods. In order for us to develop the resilience and the mechanisms to cope with those things and empower our resilient citizens, we ask for international financial institutions to be reformed, adaptation programs to be increased, and Africans should have a common voice so that we can take it to the next scope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, mm. Deputy Prime Minister. And I want to confirm as a neighbor where the whereabouts of uh, the President of Somalia and give him our regards. Um, let me take this opportunity. The President of Nigeria passed by and did request me to give a chance, a very brief moment, Minister, two minutes. Isaac Adenkule, the Minister of State for Environment from Nigeria. If he is in the house, you have the floor. And, oh yeah, thank you. Minister, please make it brief. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. I am here to deliver the Nigerian statement on behalf of my president, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who is unable to uh, be here because he has to be in New Delhi, India, to be part of the uh, summit of G20 leaders. Your Excellencies, President of the African Union, my brother, the President of Kenya, fellow African presidents, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Excellencies, speaking on behalf of Nigeria, I extend my heartfelt congratulations for the landmark occasion that marks the inaugural AU African Summit. This event, as well as our recent efforts and advocacy on the topic of climate of change, boldly demonstrates to the global community that Africa is rising to the challenge and taking decisive steps to deliver a sustainable economic future for our people. The African Climate Summit occurs at a pivotal juncture, offering us an exclusive stage to spotlight our priorities, solutions, and needs regarding climate action to the global community. As a continent, it is critical that climate action supports social economic development for us. We know that with robust planning, and increased investment in the region, this is achievable. Africa is already bearing the brunt of a climate crisis that it did not cause. But our continent, with our significant renewable energy resources, critical minerals, vast carbon sink, and growing population can be a strong solution center. Distinguished participants, in Nigeria, we have articulated our unchanging position to advance climate action without jeopardizing economic development. We designed an ambitious energy transition plan to achieve universal access to energy by 2030 and net zero emission by 2060, while prioritizing industrialization, job creation, and economic growth. Significantly, our plan helps to crystallize the scale of resources needed to deliver climate targets so that by the current financial flows will not suffice. Nigeria's energy transition plan 
requires 1.9 trillion in spending up to 2060, including 410 billion above business as usual spending. This is additional financing requirement translates to about 10 billion per annum, but average international financing flows to Nigeria for clean energy have been about 65, 655 million per year over the last decades. Similarly, the unconditional target in our nationally determined contributions requires $7.7 .7 billion in investment annually. In 2019-2020, all sub-Saharan Africa received barely approximately $20 billion USD in climate finance. Annual climate finance flows to Africa are currently just 11% of what we require. So more investments have to come to the continent. For us in Nigeria, we are presently establishing partnership with both public and private sector players, driving innovative policy changes, advancing renewable energy projects, including on-grid solar and electric vehicle development, and exploring innovative financing mechanisms like carbon trading to lay the foundation for an all-encompassing transition. I recently made public the key focus of my government captured as an eight-point agenda, climate action and environmental sustainability is central to achieving four of those agenda, which are food security, poverty eradication, sustainable job creation, and security. We recognize that just energy transition partnerships are emerging as an important source of capital for climate-sensitive energy efforts in developing regions, and Nigeria wants to be considered for one. My team is currently working on a proposal to the G7 for the Jet P for Nigeria. It is encouraging that South Africa and Senegal have secured Jet Ps, but they must be scaled up across Africa in addition to other strategic financing opportunities. This summit is essential for highlighting such requests, sharing ongoing efforts, and establishing inter-country collaboration. Mr. President, I assure you and fellow leaders of Nigerian unwavering support as we embark on this journey to, cl to clearly communicate Africa's position on climate action and expedite an equitable, sustainable future for all of us. God bless Africa. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you very much, Minister. I will extend another two minutes to my brother Ban Ki Moon. If he is still in the house, if he is not, then I will um, request the Honorable Huang Rungui from China, the Minister for Ecology. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Okay. Zhenjin 各位同事，我们一起共同讨论积极应对气候变化，实现可持续发展。这里啊，我首先要感谢肯尼亚政府和鲁托总统举办了这一次成功举办了这一次盛会，也非常感谢鲁托总统邀请中国政府出席这次会
洪水、泥石流和滑滑坡灾害，以及高温热浪，这些都已经造成了严重的生态、生命财产损失和生态的危机。气候变化是全球性的挑战，我们唯有团结合作，才能有效应对。联合国气候变化框架公约及其巴黎协定的达成。来之不易，体现了全球最大的共识。我们应始终坚持共同带有区别的责任原则、公平的原则和各自能力的原则，筑牢全球气候合作的政治基础。非洲大陆是一片特别脆弱的土地，也是全球最易受气候变化影响的地区之一。在全球气候治理的行动中，也是一支不可缺少的重要力量。面临发展、减贫、应对气候变化多重的挑战，非洲国家应采取有力的行动，适应气候变化，减缓适应气候变化，为全球实现巴黎协定目标做出我们的努力。中国。是拥有十四亿多人口的最大的发展中国家，对非洲面临的困难和挑战，我们感同身受。中国国家主席习近平指出，应对气候变化不是别人叫我们做，而是我们自己必须要做的。中国提出了二零三零年前碳达峰、二零六零年前碳中和的。NDC 目标，我们采取有力的行动，已取得了积极进展。可以说，这方面中国是应对气候变化的积极行动派。过去十年，中国以年均百分之三的能源消费，支撑了年均超过百分之六的经济增长。可再生能源的装机，到去年年底已经超过了十三亿千瓦。并且极大地降低了全球可再生能源的成本，为全球应对气候变化和减排做出了巨大的贡献。我们建成了覆盖四十五亿吨二氧化碳排放的全国的碳市场，生产了全球一半以上的新能源汽车，累计造林十点二亿亩。为全球贡献了四分之一的新增的绿化面积。过去十年，中国与非洲国家的气候合作取得了巨大的实效。我们积极推动非洲国家建设低碳和适应气候变化的示范区，加强清洁能源领域的基础设施建设合作，支持。智慧农业设施，援助增强防灾减灾能力，支持实施绿色长城计划。二零二一年，中非共同发布了《应对气候变化合作宣言》。截至二零二三年八月，中国已与十五个非洲国家签署了合作应对气候变化的谅解备忘录。借此机会啊，我也非常荣幸的宣布，为落实宣言，中国计划开发实施应对气候变化南南合作的非洲光带项目，援助非洲相关国家开发利用太阳能资源，帮助解决用电困难，助力实现全社会的绿色低碳发展，发展。承载着人民对美好生活的向往。发展中国家的第一要务，就是发展是发展中国家的第一要务。近期啊，习近平主席发起了支持非洲工业化倡议，中国助力农非洲农业现代化计划等新举措、新倡议。我们愿与非洲国家一起。共同探讨、深化中非合作应对气候变化
与可持续发展，携手推进绿色低碳的现代化进程。同时，我们也呼吁发达国家主动承担历史责任，尽快兑现每年为发展中国家提供至少一千亿美元气候资金的承诺，并使适应资金翻番。作为《生物多样性公约》第十五次缔约大会 （COP 十五）的主席，我还想呼吁各位要重视生物多样性保护与应对气候变化的内在联系。我刚才听了不少国家领导人的发言，都谈到非洲大陆有非常丰富的森林资源，也蕴含着极大的碳汇资源。中国愿与国际社会一道，推动全面落实昆明、蒙特利尔全球生物多样性框架，共建人与自然和谐共生的地球家园。最后，我预祝本次会议取得圆满成功。谢谢大家。Thank you very much, Minister. Let me now take this opportunity for another two minutes. To ask uh, my brother Achin Steiner, the UN Under Secretary responsible for UNDP, to make some brief remarks. That is another Kenyan from a place called Nakuru. <laughs> Asante sana, Mr. President, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Heads of State and Government, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. A great deal has been said this morning, but I'm still inspired, if I may say so, by your speech this morning, Mr. President. And with that, I take a license for a moment to take you back to a year in Kenya's history when you were 15 and I just a little bit older. It was the year that in Olkaria in Hell's Gate National Park, the first geothermal unit was installed. I mention this because the journey of Kenya in so many ways represents when it comes to the energy sector, To leadership, to transition, to many of the things that you spoke about this morning, reflects what happens when people do not take the answer. It's not possible. It's not doable. It's too expensive. Too seriously. Hell's Gate National Park is only about an hour outside Nairobi. Kenyans know it well. Visitors, please visit it because it is today one of the most remarkable places, the backbone of Kenya's electricity-generating economy. That first Mitsubishi turbine installed in 1981 was installed against a great deal of skepticism. I learned about this history during the years that I spent here. It took many pioneers to envisage it. Today, Mr. President, I believe that Olkaria, with its various generating turbines, generates almost a thousand megawatts of electricity. And, ladies and gentlemen, you are in a country that may very well become the first country in modern history. To actually generate its entire electricity supply with clean energy sources, <laughs> Kenya today is a country that has passed the 92% mark, and it is no longer alone. In fact, Mr. President, there is another country in South America I visited, and I did not know. Uruguay today, well over 90% of its electricity supply with renewables. This is not to say that every country can follow the same path. But what we do in UNDP, and why I'm so proud to be here together with my Secretary General and so many of the partners that are today invested in precisely the kind of vision that you have laid out for Africa, is that we can be partners. We have listened, we have learned, we have learned together. And today, as UNDP, 36 countries on the African continent have invited UNDP to help them undertake integrated national financing frameworks to address this. Continuously frustrating reality that this continent is asked to borrow for things that it was neither responsible for nor it can afford to borrow in this world of today. That is why looking at finance with the kind of lens that you have both spoken to this morning is so important. Secondly, also pioneering projects such as solar mini grids, another major enterprise of UNDP. For the first time in history, we are. Supporting 21 African countries to try and connect over the next few years, 260 million people to electricity supplies—a $65 billion investment opportunity. But it needs hard work 
both to prepare the ground, to find the investors, and to then roll it out. And finally, Mr. President, let me just commit to you in the presence of so many leaders from across the continent. The United Nations Development Program, as part of the United Nations family, as you heard from the Secretary General this morning, is deeply committed to Africa's future transitions, coming out of the reality of today, but investing every day across the continent. I'm proud to today lead an organization within our UN development system that is literally present in every African country on this continent. We are invested in terms of your nationally determined contributions. We are invested in your energy transition just as deeply as we're invested in poverty eradication and ultimately a future for Africa that you spoke so eloquently this morning. Thank you so much for the privilege of addressing you today, and thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. I guess everybody, when they get a chance, they speak about their village, the old career where Stena has very passionately talked about is in his county of Nakuru. Thank you very much. Now, let me uh, give another two minutes. Finally, this is the final one to Bill Gates on video for two minutes, and then we will move the program to the next stage. Hello, I want to thank President Ruto for convening this event and prioritizing this important work. I started work on climate change over two decades ago after I left my full-time work at Microsoft and I was focusing on fighting poverty and fighting diseases. When I visited Africa, I saw two things. Uh, first was how climate is already affecting uh, agricultural output although they've contributed almost nothing uh, to these greenhouse gas emissions because uh, they're dependent on farming, they're near the equator, uh, they're already experiencing more damages than other countries. But I also saw the energy shortage and we need Africa uh, to have lots and lots of energy to develop their economies. It's fantastic that the African researchers and companies are now thinking about how they can reduce their emissions and continue to grow their economies. Breakthrough Energy is the organization I created uh, to help with climate mitigation. Uh, the goal is to innovate, uh, to make the cost of being clean uh, far, far less. Um, and that means we can reduce the emissions and avoid this temperature increase uh, that has such a, a negative impact. Uh, late last year, I, I was in a farm in eastern Kenya, uh, and they were experiencing drought. And so I talked through uh, with Mary, who was the farmer, uh, how the new seeds and new approaches were helping her. Uh, she had drought-tolerant uh, seeds uh, that made a very big difference. Uh, she also had uh, chickens that were bred uh, so they could be more heat-tolerant. And because of uh, those new tools that were empowering her, uh, she was expecting to do well despite uh, the tough climate challenge uh, that she faces. And so this is just one example, but by helping with better tools, uh, allowing uh, farmers like her, who are you know, very uh, innovative, uh, to do new things, you know, we can minimize these damages. I've seen there's uh, African researchers work on, on innovations in fertilizer, uh, making sure these new crops fit their ecosystems and getting those seeds out, getting them approved and making sure they're low cost. So we do need to invest, uh, whether it's in the innovation or the deployment, getting uh, resources against those, including the promised support from rich countries will be very, very important. The global goal on adaptation, which will be finalized at COP, uh, should lead to more investment to help Africa uh, deal with these challenges. And so we need partnerships. We need government, philanthropists, businesses to come together to focus on climate adaptation. Yes, we need mitigation, but uh, adaptation doesn't get the energy it deserves. And so I'm excited uh, that you've come together. I'm excited to work uh, with all of you uh, to solve this problem 
Uh, so thank you for your efforts. So ladies and gentlemen, as we now wait, we're going to take a very short interlude of music. And at this point, uh, we can, can we all just stand up and stretch a little bit? Um, just stand up wherever you are and see whether we can stretch. I'm sure some of us have been sitting for long, long periods of time. So the next part we're coming to is the new global climate finance architecture. This is a centerpiece and a part that we've been waiting for all this time. And therefore, thank you so much for your patience. You can sit down now. You can take your seats. I just wanted you to stand up and stretch for a little bit. And this is definitely going to be one of the highlights of this whole conference. So we request that we just remain patient. And this is where we are heading from here. So I request that we have a short interlude of music. Uh, just to get us ready for the next session. As mentioned, it's a new global climate finance architecture that is coming up right here. So for now, let's have the interlude of music as we get ourselves ready. <laughs> 